that the general manager submitted, but he did his job. And for members of this board of directors, the public lambast him for doing his job. This is beyond the pale. I don't quite understand it. And I don't know what's wrong. It, it, It says here that the budget was made without much input from department heads. I expect that Mr. Bailey would dispute that. Mm -hmm. if <coughs> Hiller went on to say that she does not have confidence in some of Bailey's numbers, nor does she appreciate his approach. This man is your employee. Talk about him like that in public is terrible. Terrible. If he did that to his employees, you would all be sent that <laughs> way. Taylor <laughs> says he threw the board <laughs> under the bus. says that people are asking her to run again. Then it's why would anybody want to run for the board? It's terrible. And it's worse when you can't get the GM on the same page. He goes over the one. Um, it's not right. Thank you. Other public comments? <clears throat> Good morning, my name is Joe Brocky. I live here in the Gamer Room. I uh, wrote down, but I can't remember anything. Uh, first of all, I'd like to know, is it Friendly Guard is done? And if it is, when will we see the results? Second, I would like to see a line-by-line -line sheet of where we, look, we spent a million and six. Who we spent it to. We end up paying it to somebody because we have to pay it back. And I have yet to see, okay, like, okay, we spent X amount of money, this time guy here, this time guy here, this improvement or whatever. We haven't seen that. And I want to know if any of the board or the GM are bonded. If they're not, why not? You're responsible for a lot of money. At least if there's mismanagement going on, we can have a chance of getting some of it back. And also, uh, how many homeowners haven't paid your assessments? I mean, it's a revenue stream for us. And if if we find out the homeowners don't pay their assessments according to the contract, which are which are legal uh, um, way of getting back, you know, put a lien on our property. You stand by one second, Charlie. Uh, it's been said that the sound is not being broadcast. Can you We're working on that. On that please? We're working on. Sorry, sir. Thank you. Yeah, the, like I said, about the homeowners not paying their assessments. I I think according to our. Uh, homeowner docs that you sign when you buy your property. It's a legal contract. And we're able to put lien on our property if they don't pay it. And the same way with the, how many properties are in foreclosure. The banks obviously aren't going to pass. But if we put a lien, a mechanics lien, simple process, mechanics lien, they do it all the time. If you put a mechanics lien on property, these will get some of the money back when they sell their property, even if they buy it yourself. Thank you. I was going to actually, um, I'm sorry, one bit before you speak. So, a couple of uh, answers to your question. So, with regard to the forensic audit, uh, the detective WCBI, uh, Detective Tatansky, uh, who was assigned to the case over the past year and some odd months, uh, was promoted. Uh, he's now the deputy chief at, at Worcester County. Uh, they had um, assigned another uh, detective to that case. So, as my fellow board members know, I'm somewhat impatient uh, when it comes to certain commitments. Uh, I had written Detective Tatansky back on January 9th uh, because Jim Kern, who is the auditor for Gross Mendelson, had been trying to get in touch with him. He's got to um, go out, and one of the other tasks was to interview some more folks from the Bank of Ocean City. Um, at this point, yesterday, I, I wrote another email to them, and I uh, included some other folks. Uh, and I got a response back that said, and thank goodness Detective Tatansky said, he's contacted the new investigator that's been assigned to the case, and on Monday we'll arrange that meeting with Jim Kern from Gross Madison. So the process is ongoing. It's been a little bit stalled, if you will, 
but every intention that uh, it's, it's moving forward. That's all I can say right now. So there has been, you know, some progress is still ongoing. With regard to the collections, I believe last year, and somebody helped me out. I think we were at 98% collection rate, meaning we had 98% of our homeowners uh, had collected the information. The other two percent. Uh, I believe, and I don't have that list, but we, we, there have been liens filed against the, you know, per our attorney, because our attorney now, that gets turned over to the attorney, and they're looking for collections, et cetera, et cetera. I think we even have a number, and Ted's not in your head, that I think we actually collected almost $200,000 last year of those unpaid assessments uh, as, as part of that. So it's an ongoing process. Have we cleared every single person that owes us money? No, but that process is ongoing behind the scenes. So. Did that include your bank? Uh, not at this point. I don't. I don't think so. But I'd have to. Give, can I ask a favor? Could you send an email to directors at oceanpines.org so that we'll look into that for you and see if we have any detailed information, especially with regard to the number of outstanding uh, properties that still owe money and how many of those are foreclosure or bank versus you know privately owned. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's like with the bank taking some of the property for a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, they can. But it, we're losing a thousand dollars of. Property. Yeah, yeah. And, and my goal is to try to get you that. Information. One other thing on the loss last on, on the one point six million dollars, that's a, a kind of a two year loss in there because um, we lost three hundred and something thousand one year and then one one point two or one point three. That's an operational loss. And all you have to do is go to the website and pull up the financials. You can just take the month of April of last year and it will show you exactly where it happened and the majority well a large chunk of it is the overrun in food and beverage and that was eight hundred and forty something thousand dollars alone so you can see exactly what departments how the departments work it's in absolute detail you can't miss and if you have questions when you look at that you know certainly if, if you see an area that you'd like to have some more information we can get that for you yeah, let me just add a couple of things. I think uh, this is probably a good information to distribute publicly. I would like to suggest maybe the GM, as part of his uh, monthly update, uh, put out um, some kind of a statement, either in a quarterly newsletter, where we can break down what attributed to the deficit you know, in groups. And I think, that, yeah, because I've seen you do it, and I think this would be a good education for the entire membership. And the second would be on a delinquency status. If you can just display, you know, what's the outstanding balance, what's been collected last year, uh, what are the uh, the actions the board and the management is taking in terms of liens, foreclosures, etc. It's a good kind of FYI information distribution to the entire membership because I'm sure there's a lot of them in addition to this gentleman that are interested in knowing more yeah. about this. So it's a good kind of a fact, fact uh, to distribute. The reason I asked about it is because we heard once before from the gentleman mm -hmm. and the crowd that there were several people in his public sack that weren't paying their assessment. You know, and I was wondering if we were doing anything about it. All right. Yeah. So, so again, let's close the issue on that. Right. Well, if, if you can send us that information or send a request, that absolutely follow up and get you that information. Thank you. Other public comments? Good morning. Good morning. I'm Paula Gray. I live at 88 my concern is the vitriol we're seeing. How do we address us out here? You're the board. You are the board. We need to lose that pronoun I. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to vote for this. Okay? We, we, it's, it's, it should be we, and the we should reflect the us. Sorry, what comment is that? You're supposed to be we. Okay, so when all of a sudden we're reading, you all have really bad information out there, everything that you brought to these comments, all of it was bad, awful, terrible, worse, then we have to wonder why the correct information is not disseminated. I saw today for one of the first times, thank you Mr. Parks, an answer to a comment. We were supposed to have open meetings where we could ask things. We've been six months since the last election, give or take a week, okay, and we haven't had but one the town hall meeting should have been before this budget, where people could have come and gotten it off their chest instead of coming in and doing this now. All right. And we need to really, really realize that we are us. The $120, everyone's running around like my grandmother used to say, the proverbial chicken with its head cut off, when you should, if you find a better way to present it, it's $10 a month, $120 a year. 
and maybe we'll get this place balanced. No one's addressed the fact that it hasn't been balanced for years. These don't, we don't know what it's going to take. Mr. Bailey, in good faith, came out with what he thought was a budget. Please don't jump up and down. It makes me nervous. I don't <laughs> One comment at a time, please. That is my rule for running this meeting. Okay? I can't remember it all. So. Be back again. $120. If you present it to people and say, we don't know that this is going to be enough. We don't know that it's going to work. But what we've done in the past has not worked. And we cannot continue to run at a deficit. Wishes are great. I wish I was younger and cuter. Wishes are wonderful, all right? But they're just wishes. And if we don't look at what we need to do to move forward for the next 50 years, we're ignoring where we are. It's really easy to, to wave a flag and say, no, no more money. But sometimes you have to pay more money. We're not spending the same for our groceries, our gasoline. I, our employees right now, if I was an employee here, I'd be looking for a job. Because it's like everyone just wants to get rid of people. Stop it. Present it to us the way we need to hear it. People out here aren't slow anymore. Say, okay, we don't like this. Give Mr. Bailey and this budget a chance to bring a balance to where we are. And if next year it doesn't work, oh well. Then you can throw Mr. Bailey under the bus. We have, we do, and I agree wholeheartedly. We had a, a whatever you call it, an addendum about behaving civilly. Wow, where the hell did that go? Thank you very much. Other public comment? I don't think we should just accept $127. Okay. 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 May I not live at 101, the monks are landing room, and the corner going to the yacht club. I take care of that whole corner, my lot, and probably out to the parkway and some other things. I think this community just has to unite together. I mean, familiarity and some other stuff. I think we all need to put a big forward pants on. This is a lot of contrite BS. I, mean, I apologize and I'm emotional or whatever at that. But I can't live with 15% or 127 because inflation last year was about 3% and that's what it should reflect. Any increase into this budget. And somehow we got to figure out we don't need all these motors. We don't need all these new trucks. What's insurance and all that stuff cost? I mean, the culprits, who's responsible for taking care of them? I take care of mine. I take care of my leaves and all. People complain. That's, that's it's trivial. And I mean, that can't be what put us in the hole. 1.6 million. 1.2 in one year. And it's we have to live within our means. It's simple. I think. I, I don't understand it. I mean, I think it's a waste of time. I think whatever this class, you people are the ones who got to tell us what you're going to do to go forward. And I mean, I love the community and all that, but I think they get up and take care of their own stuff and all that. I mean, I, used to, I don't get it. <coughs> yeah, I feel like uh, kids that washed it in Philadelphia stores or whatever. And it's like, talk to me like I'm a three-year-old or whatever. You know, this, this is not that hard. I mean, you take in $8.5 million a year, right? It's not, you know, that a corporate early you know, there's 8,500 lots or whatever, and I mean, you take in that, right? So you got 14 million sitting in the bank account somewhere, or, you know, whatever. I know you're gonna spend for the budget or whatever, but still, does that get interest? Interest what, uh, two years ago, when, when Trump got elected or whatever, whatever was about 10%, you know, on regular conservative stuff, zero or whatever. I mean, so, so that 14, did you get 140, Thousand. I mean, I don't. I, I mean, that's on top of one six. You know, it starts to add up, and I don't get it. The trucks that run around. It's not just Ocean Pines. It's Worcester County. It's everywhere. Just don't forget their stuff's going up, and there's the water tax and all that. At the end of the day, I'm getting to what it was in Northern Baltimore County, which pushed me away at five thousand dollars, and I got nothing. Oh no, they picked my trash up once or twice a week. Was it because I had a well, you know, then I got a flush tax from Bobby Ehrlich and, and, and East Baltimore County and and here, you know, when a person down here, what's her name, the exit up 10%. It's like, what is going on with this money? The incompetency is what's going on. Our fast and furious BS, you know, a buddy of mine said in the 80s, you know, 
I'm a carpenter, man. People don't see detail and all that. That yacht club's pathetic. I walked in there day one, whatever, looking at the reveals on the doors, the sweater sweeps and all that, and undulation on this. Who's inspecting this? Who allows it even to get that far? And I mean, who's held accountable at that point? And I mean, that place, you know, I'm walking up on that Harvard floor up there, and Matt Orr doesn't care about that place. He, he's making money. He's good to go or whatever. I'm going to get in trouble probably for this. But, you know, I'm going to speak my opinion at this point. That, that place was never right in the beginning. If you paid them all the money, the 4.8, because it went from 4.5 to 4.8, I, I don't get it. You need me to walk around and show you what's wrong or whatever. It's not a big deal to me. I got no problem. I got a good eye for detail. I worked on $6 million mansions. Thank you. That's all I got. Uh, Steve, uh, it's been reported we still have an issue with sound. Yep, we're still working on it. Good. Thank you. So when are we going to get this straight? <laughs> I want to sound Steve, before yeah. I speak. <laughs> uh, it's recording here. We were all quiet. <laughs> Can we do it again? <laughs> no. So we have a gag order? <laughs> <laughs> press is here. It's all you need. Alright, come on. Is this working? Yeah. No? Yeah. Take a break. <laughs> Josh, I'm on this thing broadcast of the so we all do so the whole meeting. He's sick of this. Can't get a single broadcast of the board meeting. Correct. There's a part of the that I was doing. Yeah. Is it KB? Is it KB? Recess for five minutes, and then we got to keep moving on. I'll speak to them about the thing being on. That's okay for me. I can yeah. talk about the commission. The mic's working in here. Yeah, it's okay. just not coming through. Yeah, and, it's, and, it's, okay. video. and it's being recorded on the video. So. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Carol Fritz. I live at 1290 Ocean Parkway. And first of all, I'd like to say thank you for all of you volunteering for the board. I would not want to be in your position. <laughs> Uh, the other thing I would like to say is, I sat last night, went over the last few things for the period, past few years that you have done to improve the community. One was the gym floor, the other one was Franklin Meadows. Great projects, but then I see this year again that we have playground equipment. I Thank you. I don't really think that that should be, since we just addressed it a few years ago, why are we addressing these little frivolous things? Pickleball, re uh, designing the gym with uh, new paint. This is absurd. Uh, a $2,000, $200,000 addition to the courts pool for a uh, supposedly after school program. They just opened one across the street last week. So we're addressing things that aren't exactly in our community, but for the whole county. We're turning into a municipality rather than an HOA. I signed off for an HOA. I read what an HOA does. It maintains. It supports. That's roads, that's ditches. Um, Mr. Bailey came out last year, which I thought was great. He wanted to do away with the leaf removal. I looked through the whole thing. There's nothing I think. It says we have to pay so much money for leaf removal. He got flat for it. People have got to learn to live within the budget and their means, including our managers. I work for a heck of a large corporation, and I had a lot of people under me. And every year when a fiscal budget came around, was from corporate, how much can you cut? I mean, it got to the point that we were doing two-sided copies because somebody had to come up with that 10% cut. It seems like we have a utopia, and we're the cash cows. And it's not right. I mean, you live with us. You know it's hurting you in the pocket. I was with 41 from Ocean Pines yesterday. And it's sad the comments were coming out. And a lot had to do with the papers. I'm sorry. We got to stop dishing each other in these papers. It's disheartening. It's sad. You're adults. We're all adults. We've got to learn to get through this together. Please stop this nonsense. Don't give free anything to the paper. There's this thing saying, no comment right now. We're not sure. Nobody seems to know that comment. Please, please, just stop hurting each other. Okay, for public comments. 
I'm going to start with a newspaper. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, I'm going to read a quote from uh, Bayside Gazette. Uh, they're getting free ads today, I guess. Um, I'm all for it. So, page uh, 10 from the current uh, issue of the Bayside Gazette, and it states the following. I quote, Ladies and gentlemen, we are trying to find our way back from an absolute disaster in the community. In August of 2016, this organization was out of deficit, <clears throat> and within a year and a half, actions have been taken, and a direction had been set to put us a million and a six in debt. End quote. Then it continues. Terry, Tom Terry, continues to say the following. Quote, let's not blame these folks. He was referring to the four directors that were at the meeting, budget hearing last Saturday. Let's not blame these folks. There is only one of them left up there. And he, is not, he has not showed up to them. End quote. Who is that director? This was um, a quote attributed to Tom Terry, former board member and president of the association. Anybody that pays attention to our association affairs knows that Tom Terry was referring to me, Slobodan Trump. I just said, former president of the association and a board member. So, <clears throat> why do I feel compelled to bring this up? Because probably a lot of people are wondering why I did not attend last Saturday meeting. So let me answer that question. The reason I wasn't there last Saturday is because I was out of town. My wife like you I get emotional. <laughs> my wife was having a surgery and that was my priority. Now, I don't want to do what Mr. Terry did with his quote. So I'm just going to deal with the facts. The fact is that I joined the board in August of 2016. That's the time period Mr. Terry was referring to. On September 9th of the same year, Doug Parks joined the board. He wasn't elected, he was appointed. The following year, in August of 2017, Colette Horn joined the board. In September of 17, Ted Maroney was appointed a director of the board. So, The third point I wanted to make is that during this period of time when these issues with our financial performance were going on, I did everything I could to stop the train wreck. I spoke publicly, I questioned 20% discount, I questioned raises, I questioned promotions, I questioned crazy revenue projections. I voted against the budget both years in 2016 and 2017, in both years I voted against because I knew we were in for a tough ride. And I was right, unfortunately. And anybody that wants to know, there was only another director that voted against. Doug Parks voted with me against the budget in that year. The following year that produced $1.2 million in deficit, Tom Herrick voted against the budget, along with me, just in case you guys are wondering. We were fiscal conservatives. Now, on the point that Mr. Terry is making... Hey, slow down. Can you hold one second? We're, Charlie, there's a report that now the video is not working. Rebooting. Yeah, we're restarting the live stream. Sorry, sir. Yeah, that's all right. 
So on the point that Mr. Terry was making, that he says that uh, in 2000, in August of 2016, the organization was out of deficit. I'm not going to question that statement, but I'm going to tell you the facts. The year Mr. Terry was the president of the association, that's 2013, our audited financials balance sheet states the following. Fund operating balance deficit $1.021 million. In 2014, audited financial state operating deficit balance of $559,000. In 2015, operating deficit balance of $712,000 and a change. In 2016, the year Mr. Terry left the board, operating deficit balance was $402,000. The following year, when I joined the board, we ended a year with a reduction. We actually reduced it to a deficit of $363,000. That is the operating balance deficit. So, a lot of people read the newspapers and sometimes this kind of information that gets disseminated leaves wrong impression. And I just wanted to set the record straight. These are not my interpretations. What I convey to you are the facts. And you can use the factcheck.org to validate them. Thanks for your attention. Yeah. Steve, did we uh, get the feedback online yet? We do not. All right. In the interest of time and the original intent of this, met, uh, this meeting, I'm going to close public comments. Let's get into the open discussion. Obviously, uh, this meeting was held to continue our discussions on the budget, so uh, I will open the floor for the first comment. Ted. All right. What I'm going to suggest is that we just hit a couple of items that I don't think there's going to be a lot of disagreement on and kind of come to closure. One would be uh, pulling the sports core edition out of the budget. The second would be pulling the pay study out of the budget, continue to keep the 2% in, and go ahead and do what budget and finance unanimously agreed or voted on a couple weeks ago, and that's to just take, and we're going to go to 80-20 on the benefits, but go ahead and do the bonus part out of pocket this year since we're not adjusting that and that'll save $128,000 plus uh, another two ninety six dollars per person on the thing. So I'd like to throw those two out first because I think they're pretty straightforward. And I, uh, John, all right. So comments on the let's take them one at a time. Or oh, John, sorry, you want to do a general comment? So oh, from BNF. So I'm sorry, Mr. Front. So you said no payroll adjustment? Yeah, correct. Okay, so no payroll adjustment. Go to eighty twenty on the medical. And it would be a lump sum reimbursement. We recommend it somewhere in the range, in 50 to 100 for the first year, and possibly for the second year, maybe 25 to 50, but some range to help with that situation. But ideally, what budget and finance asked for last year, and apparently it didn't happen, but the whole package should be looked at at market. Last year there was a big push to cut the met to cut the benefits. I said that okay, we had to make sure that everything was in line, that the salaries were in line, and the benefits were in line. And we we gave guidance to hire an HR person or cons or whatever part time to make sure that happened. With that said, now that we either feel there is no payroll adjustment, or that we just didn't get what we were supposed to receive in order to substantiate it, let me just finish and then definitely, that, okay, go to the 80-20 on the medical to get there, but let's give assistance on that, and that's the reason for that. But again, ideally would have been make sure the pay was in line and the benefits. So yeah, this would definitely help get there. And my hope would be that what would end up happening during the course of this year, 
before we get to next year that we would go back and look at that pay study and rather than have to exactly. add anything in there, we'd eliminate that the second year. You're just using that as a fallback in case exactly. the adjustment part isn't yep. made. Exactly. So we're on the same page. Yeah. Yep. Anything, this gentleman? I don't know. You I heard him say 2%. And then he said, you said no or whatever. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I swear I heard you say two All right, hold on. Two pieces. Two separate areas. Two separate areas. Merit raise. Merit raise. It's not across the board. Right. So what does that mean? It means if somebody has someone who's done an excellent job and they're eligible for a raise, 2% merit raise is what we're tapping at, up to 2% merit raise. So we're playing semantics with work. No, it's not no, across no, the board. No, let me explain to me. There's a pool of money that's assigned for a merit increase. It's 2% of the, of the payroll. Okay, that is given out to based on now, just so now, based on high performers, based on folks that may just be under the minimum required for a specific job. It's up to the discretion of the general manager based on his assessment of staff performance. Okay, so that money is like a cost of living increase. No, not really. Just it's, it's just a it's just a merit. Is it? it's, two, is it? it's just two percent. You're not saying what that number actually is, are you? We have that two percent of what? Two percent of the payroll. That's everybody. Right. Though. You understand what I'm saying? Right. So that two percent could be if only fifty percent of the people. It's seventy. It could be four. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Seventy-two, seven ninety-one. Right. <coughs> all employees got a 2% No. Oh, it's not that? No. That's the number I'm asking. Yeah. So not all employees will be getting a 2% raise. How many employees? Somebody's got to know the answer. 80 some odd full time and 140 seasonal. Oh, let's not get hung up as much. There's a 2% pool for Mary. Okay. Your numbers in, and I think you make us give our address and name. I think you guys should tell us your names and what you do. I, 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 Doug Park, 16 so Sailors. You are. Okay, you know what I'm you feel better now. This is my beginning of it. Okay. I'm getting involved. All right, understood. The 2% merit rate, okay? That's what's there, all right? 80 20. We all agreed on that. Let's hope that. There's a lot of variables. All right. I had Frank and then Steve. And what is Yeah, I mean, uh, this pay study, when we say talk about look at it, I'm going to make a more formal suggestion. I think we need to get somebody on the order of Willis Towers to come in because our payroll is an unmitigated mess. Okay? We have people that are low. We have people that are high. We have a payroll study that um, when it came out, uh, in the interest of full disclosure to people on the board, uh, the leading line on it is we're in an overheated labor market. So I happened to, to contact the, the person that did it and I said, well, what's the statistics from the Federal Reserve Bank which shows that Worcester County has unemployment that averages in the off season 10%. That's not an overheated labor market. That's not reflected anywhere in this pay study. Our benefits, which are reserved for the top 1% of people in America, okay, need looked at. Not only from the standpoint of we offer health care, but what is that health care? What's the deductibles? What's the coverage? That needs a total look at because what we've done over time, in some cases, is say we'll pay less and we'll give more benefits. And what that has done to us structurally is salaries go up 2% a year, health care goes up 10 to 12% a year, and we have a big chunk of employee costs in health care. The second thing that we don't do in this payroll study is we're not talking about, when we talk compensation, it's typically, you know, you make X number of dollars an hour based on 2,000 hours of work, and then your, your benefits also equate to X number of dollars an hour. We need to do that and get it back to where it should be, which is for the Eastern Shore and for this area that says if somebody should be making $15 an hour, then pay them $15 an hour. If their health care benefits and other benefits should be worth 3 or 4 or 5 or $10 an hour, should be 10 not the mix match that we have today. It's unfair to the employees, and it is unfair to the homeowners, and it needs to change. Yeah, I just just to clarify, in the, in the budget that we were looking at, it was $128,000 for the pay adjustment 
that is what Ted is suggesting we take out completely. So that, and just so you understand it. By that by 2%, by how many no, the 2% is, is completely separate, sir. That's what I'm trying to explain. The 128 was a payroll adjustment, a one-time adjustment in people's payroll. 2% is a pool of money for merit raises if warranted. Is that every year? No, it's this so year's budget. Today, this it's this year. year's budget and two per. Okay. Okay, so all you can do is right take the number of employees. That would be a fair or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's simple math. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whatever mm -hmm. else. Yeah, I just want to make a comment um, <coughs> on what uh, Ted and uh, Frank have said. Um, I think the payroll is um, an elephant in the room that needs to be addressed, and I feel like in a way that we are in a reaction mode as opposed to being proactive, and we had an opportunity since last year to begin to work on that and um, I'm disappointed that really that hasn't happened. So now, not only is the management of the association in a reactive mode, but it's also the board that's in reactive mode. Um, there is no simple answer to the problem and I think it's got to be gradual. Um, I agree with uh, Treasurer Viola that we'll have to look at entire compensation package, not just um, salary adjustment or benefits or entitlements. And I would like to see the numbers before I can agree on any approach. I want to see a net difference. We can use two or three employees as an example, highly compensated employees, for example, uh, department heads, then a few other employees. Let's look at if we make these adjustments, what is the net difference? Um, and that's going to help us all make feel comfortable that we are not putting undue burden on some employees that are low paying by imposing this new 20% employee contribution to the health insurance benefits. So I think instead of just hypothetically really saying, yeah, this sounds great, I really would like to see an example of two or three numbers being crunched with two or three different classes of employees so we know exactly that we are not really in, in vacuum when deciding on this. The other point I want to make, and it's because I've said this before, and I don't know if it's because uh, uh, my colleagues don't agree or because it gets lost in a translation, I am not in favor of, of, of suggested 2% um, merit-based um, uh, process. We have two classes of employees. We have wage employees and we have salaried employees. And I think there's a difference how you treat each category of employees. Hourly employees usually get raises using different standard where highly compensated salary employees usually get raises based on KPIs and performance based articulated agreed annual goals. For this year, so that we are not again kind of reacting, I would like to see us instead of going with the salary increases, we go with a one-time bonus, annual bonus to those that meet the performance set criteria. In other words, there were goals articulated for the year, they have met those goals, they get one-time bonus. Now, why am I in favor of one-time bonus as opposed to raises? It's very simple. If you look at our payroll, we have positions that have continued to increase in salaries to the point where some are actually over the top of the scale. You keep doing that, how do you fix that problem? If you keep handing out the raises, you have a problem. I'll tell you how you fix it. You have to do layoffs, you have to do outsourcing, you have to do restructuring to eliminate those highly paid positions. So we're putting ourselves in a the box. Therefore, my recommendation for this year, 
I'm okay with the 2%, but I want it to be a one-time bonus handed to those that have met their annual goals and performance criteria. And then, let's work proactively for the next year when we have a, a right uh, HR resources and other benchmarks to put in place a program that's more sustainable and more, more permanent as a policy. Oh, all right, yeah, then I got a comment. Go ahead. Um, you know, I think you present some really good ideas, and I agree with a lot of it. I just want to get clarification. The bonus, are you talking about this year for only highly compensated or across the board using bonus instead of raises? Because you talked about the hourly lower level of compensation as possibly being treated differently. Yeah, thanks, Colette. What I said is in terms of the policy and the process as far as the raises go, typically wage class employees get, uh, it's either a COLA or, or a raise based on CPI, etc. where salary employees usually um, are paid based on um, their performance and annual yeah, goals. Now the 2%, what I was referring to as far as the 2%, I was saying that it shouldn't be across the board, but the that raise the bonuses should be handed to those that have met the goals that have been set as their individual or department goals. Yeah, I understand that. I'm just asking, are you recommending that bonus structure policy be for highly compensated salary employees only and hourly uh, wage lower compensated people be treated differently in this year's budget? In this year's budget, I think we should do what's uh, in the best interest based on what are the um, goals that were set for those employees going forward. Future years, I think we need to look at proactively as a policy and define how we're going to be addressing uh, how we're going to be addressing this going into the following fiscal years. But for current year, we don't have the luxury of time to do that. So, I hope I have answered your question. <coughs> All right, uh, comment. So, regarding your statement about reactionary, I, I'm going to slightly disagree. I think we're not being reactionary, but certainly we have to uh, make some decisions fairly quickly. Uh, in fact, I think we agree, and I like to get some level of consensus, that the 2% merit pool, let's leave it there. I think it's reasonable, uh, you know, as a vehicle to, uh, you know, run through this next budget. The other thing that comes up is the pay study. Yeah, I think there's uh, been some discussion that it's been flawed, that not all the right data is there. Uh, let's also remember that we did a study back in 2017 from 5L. Okay, 5L was the company that we brought in uh, for exactly that purpose, to take a look at the pay structure, the compensation, the benefits package. Uh, and uh, to my knowledge, we haven't done anything with that. We still have that data. Yes, it's over a year and a half old. But I think it's probably time well spent to at least look at that particular study and compare it against our current compensation rates for our employees to see where there are gaps. Okay, so it's, at least it's another. If someone was to argue that uh, they're not uh, comfortable with the current pay study because it was done in house and there could be some influential numbers in there, et cetera, et cetera, I don't really care about that. The idea is let's look at the 5L study and see what that says. See if that you know sort of shows or demonstrates anything that we might have uh, overlooked or maybe we're making an assumption on. That might be the unit of work that we, that we take. However, uh, you know, that's certainly going to take some time. The, uh, the real notion here is the, uh, and I think we talked about it last year when we were doing the budget prep, and that was the, the notion of 100% you know, benefit coverage for employees by the association was not in line with industry norms. And I think uh, as, as I don't want it to sound insensitive, but I think it's our fiduciary responsibility to at least consider the notion of bringing staff back into line more with industry and in the sense of the uh, you know the 80-20 being able to uh, provide those kinds of benefits. I think that we really have to take a strong look at that. Now to your point, and it's an interesting one, and it's one that I had been contemplating for a while. We talked about this hit to the employee. Okay, so now all of a sudden you're going to take 20% out of your paycheck, and you're going to have to forward that for uh, for insurance and you know and benefits payments. The idea was 
one, and somebody had floated the idea in our many discussions that we've had, hey, why don't we just, uh, you know, give them a bump in salary to, uh, to you know, to cover that loss. Well, that's that's one thing. That might be a little more ludicrous. The other thing is uh, the notion of a one-time payout. In other words, okay, for this year, this is just under consideration. You mentioned it. We had all talked about it once or twice. You know, make up that difference, okay? Uh, and then, you know, so the, so it softens the blow to the employee. So if that's a if that's a palatable idea, my question would be how much is that really going to cost us? All right? and, you know, certainly a lot less than the 128k we have for the pay raise, but it would be interesting to at least have that number so that we can have some tangible reference to look at it and say, hey, is this really, really a good idea? And also, let's not lose sight of the fact that we wouldn't do that, we're not setting a precedence here, we wouldn't want to do that next year. This is a one time because of this, I don't want to call it shocking, but this major adjustment that we're doing to uh, the payroll. So, Ted, go ahead. But you said that's the norm. Yeah. That Why not? There, there's a couple things. If we're spending, if the employee's 20% is $1,000, and we, instead of paying $1,000 to the insurance company, pay it to them, and then take the 20% back out, that's kind of what we're talking about. So across the board, now the, the, the two things that have to be remembered, and, and the reason that people, small businesses in particular, and I used to do this, is to play around with what you give to employees and benefits is because there are two things. As soon as you take that money that you're paying to the third party and give it to the employee, you are then, the employee is then paying for that. They're now paying 7.65 in their FICA there. The association is paying 7.65 to match it. The association is paying, since they, you pay workers' comp based on payroll, whatever you're moving from an insurance expense to a payroll expense, you're adding that to your workers' comp, and then the employer, employee currently is paying after. And this goes to Frank's thing as to whether flexible savings accounts and those kind of things we should be looking at where they can do this with pre-tax dollars rather than post-tax dollars. So it, the idea here would be basically a break even this year to do this one-time bonus. And then the, the next thing to kind of go back to what Slobodan said and, and to go to what Colette was saying, Colin, I think you were talking the same thing, that if in this 2% we had an hourly employee who deserved a raise, they could get the bump. But for the people with KPIs and there, they would only get the bonus. I think that's what you were asking, so that's translation 102. So. <laughs> and I got, I got the one more comment to slow to your point. There was some, in, the, in the pay study, there were several people that were beyond uh, the upper range. Uh, I went through the pay study, uh, the current one, and just for point of reference, there's 16 employees that are under the minimum. All right, so there's there's both sides of that equation. I got it marked down here. So you know there is some level of adjustment, uh, whether or not we do that this year or next year. We certainly have to take that into consideration. So that, that's that's another that's another sort of data point for everybody. All right. I don't understand what this whole circle was. Just that you said the norms are 20 percent is their contribution. That's the norm, right? And then we said you're out here to pay all your supercracks and they can push the end up. Not true. Yeah. What? How did you start? Who did you ask to tell you that the norm is twenty percent? And I think that's probably the form of how, how many? How many references do we want? To, Steve, go ahead. Well, just what we're looking at is health insurance. The market around the country. Okay, the, the, let me finish. Let me finish. The market around the country is typically employer pays eighty percent, employee pays twenty percent. Our current setup, employees don't pay anything. We are right. So we are going to move that to an 80-20 plan, which Matt. means yes, in this coming budget. Right. If you say let's buffer it, because we're going to, you know, I don't know, Rob. Aren't you running a deficit this year, budget wise? No. But no. well, you got a 1.6. Okay. How about we take it offline and submit? Sure. I just wanted to comment that as responsible employers, when we make this change to benefits and have employees contribute to their own health insurance at a level that they never have before, that's going to hit them in the pocketbook. And they have um, a window during which they can make decisions to change how they get their health care coverage. And this bonus gives them an opportunity 
to make that decision during the open enrollment period before they have to take that financial hit. And I'm in favor of doing that because I think it's responsible employers. That's what we need to do. Thank you. Yeah, I think to the previous question, that I think the question, the bump up or the, the coverage when we go to 80-20, if I look at this memo from uh, the general manager, is $97,000. Okay, if we go to a lump sum payment. <coughs> so that brings about two, two other things. Uh, how many, if we do this, how many of our employees do not take advantage of our 100% health care and how are we going to treat those? Because we're almost getting into a case-by-case -case basis on how to handle this bump up to make it fair. And if, and if we're going to make it fair, it has to be fair to, again, both sides of the equation, the homeowners, and it has to be fair to the employees. The other thing that's kind of, let's just say, unsettling, okay, Sure, we can go to 80-20, but you know there are plans out there that where people pay 20%, uh, the employer pays 80% of, that have deductibles that are in the thousands of dollars, and there are other plans that have deductibles that are ten dollars. What kind of coverage do we have? Do we have Cadillac coverage? Do we have average coverage? Do we have below average coverage? I have not seen anything that gives any indication as to whether we have what type of plan that would fall into. So we may still go to an 80-20 and be paying way more than what's typical on the Eastern Shore for health insurance because of the type of coverages that we have. Or we could be significantly under. So to be fair, that's why it, I think the 5L, which was long before I got on the board, handles wages. The issue that I think we have to look at is benefits in terms of what is there, not only in terms of the breadth of the programs, but the depth of the programs and the type of coverage to make sure it's fair across the board? Because there's two sides of fairness to here, the homeowner and the employee. Yeah, just, just to um, add, Frank, to what you're saying, and this is why I suggested that we you know, look at a one-time situation for this year because we are running out of time. We have to approve the budget in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and not make it like a fait accompli, but really realize that we need to continue working on this. Because, yeah, I agree with you, there's a Chevy, you know, coverage and a Cadillac coverage, but I also know that employees have a choice whether they want to pick Chevy or Cadillac. We don't impose on them those coverages. So let's, let's, let's look at this uh, uh, from that perspective. But one thing, you know, I appreciate Ted um, jump-starting the conversation with, uh, with payroll because I think it is a hot topic and, and, and the benefits. But uh, to gentleman's point here, um, you know, what I really wanted to do is start with a deficit. And the reason I wanted to do that is because to me that is a gorilla in the room, okay? And what once this board has a consensus on how we want to handle the deficit for this year and going forward, that's going to have an impact on whether it's a 2% that we're going to hand out to the employees and how we're going to do everything else. And the reason I say this is because we ended last fiscal year in April of 2018, May 2018, with one6 million dollars in cumulative deficit. Then we paid it down six hundred thousand dollars. How did we do that? Collected money from homeowners. Correct. Exactly. So are we going to keep asking homeowners to pay for our mistakes? I don't think that's fair. I want to see cost cutting measures implemented. I want to see cost cutting measures implemented. I want to see where where we can find the fat that we can trim the fat. I want to see how we can run this association better. And there are ways to do it. And if the GM and the management needs examples, I'll be happy to show them. I'll be happy to sit down and show you where you can generate hundreds of thousands of dollars in savings. You know? There are two ways to address the deficit. Are we done with health care yet? 
<laughs> I'm, I'll, I'll, excuse me, Joe, please do me a favor, give me a professional courtesy, I'm speaking. Um, there are two ways to address the deficit. You increase taxes or assessments, or you deal with entitlements, entitlements and benefits. Everybody knows that. So before I increase dues, before I increase assessments, I want to make sure that we have operational efficiency in the association. Okay? Public works, amenity operations, admin, everything. Every department should be looked at. There's a bunch of savings that can be achieved. I, I, I do, point taken, I, I do want to get on one. I think one of the intentions of this meeting was to try and at least get enough discussion on a particular topic that we can collectively and separately make decisions on how we want to move forward with uh, uh, yeah, there's certain assets. We were talking about health care, we were talking about the 80-20, I think, you know, is there, if there's a general consensus that we really do need to move in that direction, I think in my mind, the question is, how are we going to handle the quote-unquote shortfall? Are we going to do it as on a, you know, a single payout basis? And if so, what's that number? It's really what it boils down to, and then how does that, if at all, affect the assessment? So I think we need to, to think about that. I'd ask uh, the input from budget and finance and our CFO to kind of help us through that and, and, and you know provide that level of advice for us. I'm sorry, just just uh, you just repeat that and I'll gladly answer it. <coughs> on the deficit or no, on 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 oh, the shortfall for the, the shortfall for no and assuming we would adopt the notion of eighty twenty on the benefits. Mm -hmm. And assuming we are discussing the notion of a single payout versus a pay raise, uh, bonus payout, how, help me understand how that would uh, you know, affect the assessment, if at all, or if that is a, a sound financial approach to addressing the situation. Question, Mr. Daly. Can I have just one question to Mr. Daly? Okay, so as far as a specific dollar amount, I, I, without stuff in front of me, I can't do it. But I'll, I'll definitely try to answer the question, which is fine. But before I answer it, I, I want to make a point. Because I have to make the point in order to answer it. First, the fact that we're talking about payroll, that we're talking about benefits, that we're talking about adjustments, and merit raises, to this degree today, several weeks into a budget process, and over a year from our last budget, last year where this was all brought up, and BNF gave guidance, provided the money in the budget for the review of it, and it wasn't executed during the year properly. That's why this board is where they are today, unfortunately, and trying to make these decisions. Everybody follow me on that? Yeah. Okay, so with that said, we'll try to do this. We'll try to do it as a whole. So in the budget, the first budget we received, there was a payroll adjustment, and that was to get people up to market from the GM. I don't have all the numbers memorized in my head. There was no decrease in benefits cost to get down to 80-20. It was still at where it was. Plus, and this makes sense, some type of increase for the increase in benefits, which is normal each year. And I believe there was a 2% overall merit increase based on the salary, the total salaries. Now, <laughs> so that was the first budget we received, which was called no assessment increase on January 3rd. Now what you're asking me is if we take out the payroll adjustment, Doug, if we go to 80-20 and keep the 2%, but not, are we then including what Ted talked about, and I talked about a lump sum, a lump sum for, different from what is talking about, a lump sum to give some relief to the employees for going to 80-20. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, the, because that's what, I believe that's what, I just don't have those numbers, but we can certainly do that. Um, it will definitely lower the assessment from that infamous January 3rd, no assessment increase, 951. Yes, it will increase it. I don't have the exact number, but that should be worked up. And I'll work it up with Steve. Um, so I want to make sure I hear. So we should pursue the notion of a lump sum payout for the medical or for the for the, inc the merit increase. Slobodan recommended something different for the, for, the for the medical. 
I recommend that from BNF, some type of relief with a range. Um, yeah. Okay. And that would give us time, as Ted pointed out, look, I didn't forget, Ted and I have spoken about it, so that we, or this GM, can execute a proper salary review. Okay. 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 Yeah, yes. that's the way to go. And this question this question falls right in, Mr. Daly, you brought about the people who have elected not to take the health insurance. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the perception that when we give this bonus to the people who we are paying for, all right, that they, they would fall short and create two types of employees. Mm -hmm. Is the employee who elected right now not to take the insurance, is he getting he or she getting more compensation per hour? Or is it just a thank you that you didn't take it? In other words, why should there be an expectation on their part that they elected not to take it? If you're going to put that in the paper and all hell is going to break loose out there. Because people are going to say, hey, wait a minute, you're get I understand your concern, that double layer of people. But why would there be an expectation on the people who aren't getting insured right now that they should be entitled to a bonus? Where does that expectation come from? Thank you. First, it's an excellent point, and let me just go back and say, when I started off, I said, our payroll is a mess, <laughs> okay? This is how you get into a mess, okay? And the way to get out of the mess, I mean, conceptually, is not difficult. You put wages where wages should be, and you put benefits where benefits should be, and you move to those simultaneously, which, as the treasurer just said, was supposed to be what was lined up for this year's budget. It didn't happen, okay? So now we're looking at a situation where we're looking, me, looking at you, seeing a lot of unhappy homeowners because we're talking a potential increase of $127, okay? I completely understand that. Believe it or not, I pay the assessment, okay? So that's one issue. The other issue is, from our employee standpoint, and you're asking me, I'll answer as an individual director, I really don't know from the information that I have in the payroll study what to do to be fair. That's the bottom line. Do you, think, you see the other people with, that were paying the insurance would say, well, why is he getting it? He didn't get anything before. Blah. Right. And the because homeowners should have said, why am I paying for him? Because we didn't give him anything before. Because this, this requires some fairly detailed information in, on an employee level. Which, by the way, I asked for about six months ago, and I got, okay? And I can tell you we're all over the board, and I can tell you if we do something on a blanket basis, this would very likely happen. We'd likely give somebody a one-time bonus for going to an 80-20 program that doesn't take health care. So they just got a windfall. That's what I'm talking about. And we don't want that to happen. So, if for my money, to make this fair for the employee, and to make this fair for you, the homeowner, we just about have to go down every single employee, look at salary, look at benefits, look what they take, look what they get, and make the adjustment on a per person basis to be fair. Thank you for your honesty. That's a good answer. Um, I think there are a lot of really important points coming up that are things that we can solve today and that will not be able to be solved with this budget. But what I would like us to resolve as a board to do is that we will have our takeaways for what, how we're gonna go forward with this budget, but also a list of takeaways of things that we're gonna fix in the next year. We're not gonna kick it down the road. We're not gonna ignore it. We're gonna take care of the stuff that didn't get done that's gonna affect the budget for next year. By the way, that's why I'm recommending we budget right now money to bring in somebody that knows what the hell they're doing and do it right and get it lined up so there's no, we don't go through this circle jerk next year. I thought we did that last year. Uh, my friend Jeff Nepper here commented to me just a minute ago that he's happy that we got into the easy item first. <laughs> so thank you for that, Jeff. How many people were at 100% for health care? How many people receive 100% payment for their health care? Forty-one. Forty-one employees receive 100% payment for their health care. 
Yeah, well, the, the, they take they take the full they take the they are enrolled. <coughs> The association pays 100% of employee health care costs for how many people? I think it was 41. I think it's I pulled out the paperwork they pay an exact I tell you what my concern here is, and, and, and you've touched on it, you're concerned about the employee, impact on the employee. If I'm an employee and say I've worked here for 10 years, um, is there any situation where this bonus will not cover, let's say if I work here another 10 years, am I going to re receive less pay at the bottom line because of this change? Um, it's going to take some analysis, but one consideration certainly is to, for those 41 people, to change uh, total employees currently contributing for health care now is 28. Total employees enrolled is 69. Well, say the all first all part again. Total employees, employees currently contributing for health care now is 28. Mm -hmm. Total employees enrolled is 69. There's about 41 difference. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, but <laughs> so I, I think some consideration should be. <coughs> When an employee leaves, dies, whatever, leaves their employee, that then that change take place. That we leave the employee. The, the employee should not suffer because of our poor management. They were employed at some point with a understanding and a, if not a contract, whatever you want to call it. And I don't think we ought to be messing around with that. If we made a mistake and we're giving them too much money, that's our fault. Uh, excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. No. The, the other thing is related to payroll, and I don't know what the numbers are exactly, but former director Marty Clark wrote a letter to the board of directors, I believe it was published in the newspaper. And if I recall correctly, he's suggesting that this uh, budget, that payroll can be reduced by $500,000. That's a substantial amount of money on the assessment. Has this board discussed that issue since we're on payroll at this point? And what is the board consensus on Mr. Clark's suggestion? All will be affected, but so we had the 28 currently contributing towards health care now. Total employees enrolled to 69. All would be affected by at least a nominal amount, but the amount affected significantly would be the difference between 69 and 28, which is 41. Uh, all right, just, I wanted to start with what I thought was the easy part. Okay, okay. Um, to address a couple things. One, there's 81 full-time employees, of which 69 are on it. So obviously any money given in a one-time bonus would only go to the 69, not to the differential between 69 and 81, so that nobody gets an add in there. Okay. okay, don't call it a bonus, please. I would call it a the adjustment. Lump sum, a lump sum adjustment would only go to the 69 that are affected by going to the 20%. The second part to get to yours, Joe, is that the idea here is to buy a year to determine where they should be in the market and you're absolutely correct uh, we don't want to end up harming the employees who came here and worked for 10 years so the idea is make sure everybody's whole this year go back and look at it and the answer may be that all of those people are grandfathered in under that program and as they're replaced it goes to 80 20. i'm just trying to get us to uh, conclusion on this budget here with something that's reasonable and, and meets where we're going the other question is, Frank, what do you think it would cost to do a separate study? Because you need to add that back in. Is it a dollar for eight eight thousand four hundred and fifty-two dollars? Uh, what you know, what, what do you plug in if you want to do another study? It's it's been a while, but I'll tell you, I put somewhere between thirty and fifty in. Well, the five L study was about fifty-six hundred dollars. Yeah. Okay, so six grand. And this is a, this. It might be a little bit bigger than that because. We're looking at going deep into benefits, potentially. 
but I mean, look, rather than we can, somebody can make a call and get a number real quick. But that the general manager should be plugging that into this when he does the ads and subtracts. Well, well, depending on what budget I'm looking at and what day, I think the original 951 no assessment increase on January 3rd had 75000 in this ratio for an HR position. Yeah. So he's got money in there. Money for the position that's in there. That's my point. Yeah, actually, I was gonna, I was gonna just respond to to uh, Joe's uh, comment on that. I, I happen to agree with Marty Clark. Uh, I wish he was sitting here instead of me. Uh, anyway, but you know, we do have a bit of problem, okay? I, and you know, I want to thank uh, Frank for uh, suggesting that we be given a um, a report on the past five years um, uh, association's expenditures versus versus CPI. It's a very telling report. In fact, I would like to ask the board to publish this online because I think it's a, it's a wake-up call for everybody. I'm just going to use two departments uh, to, to kind of validate what Marty's saying. As an example, from 2016 to what is now a proposed budget for a finance and membership department, it's about 60% increase in payroll. Marketing and communications in 2016 to proposed budget for this year, over 60% increase in payroll. This is nuts, okay? You have a position that received 20% raise a year ago that I strongly argued and objected that was not justified, not even budgeted. The same position is getting 15% raise this year? How is that possible? And I have another example. Which are you? Do you have specifics here? Yes. Yeah, he does. Yes, director of marketing. Director of marketing. Please don't. All right. Right. How is that? It's there. It is, and it, this is public information. All I have to do is request that it must be disclosed. Position must be disclosed. I did not name anybody. Position information on every job position must be disclosed. So yes, we do have a problem. I agree with Marty Clark, and I think. This pay study is important, but more importantly, we need to address what was done without any justification. How do you do that? Well, I know how to do it. If Mr. Bailey wants an answer, I'll tell him very easily how to solve the problem. Can, I, oh, can I just say something? All right, go ahead. Stuart Lackard of Nine Widows Watch. We have a county that has 10% unemployment. We're a seasonal resort town with a full-time employer with good pay and good benefits. We have a huge pool of people to pull from. We're not lacking for people needing work in this town. You can either work here or not. I'm a businessman, but there's also fiscal responsibility. And listen, you know the folks that are participating in the insurance program, they're the ones that may get some 20% help or not. We don't have to. There is no fairness in the world. It is what it is. Thank you. Representative Homer, I agree 100% with that. And like, we're doing something wrong, so we keep on doing it until it's grandfathered. That's ridiculous. You know, what we're, I thought the report said 80 20 was normal or whatever. Get doing it. Um, the two percent, whatever. There's, there's two hundred fifty thousand. Oh, it's it's funny. Get what you pay no, sir, not funny. You're laughing. No, you, sir, I'm not laughing at it. I'm not laughing. Okay, well, then I don't I mean, see any fact, humor in this. I'm not laughing, sir, but what I would recommend, if you want to come to BNF, we can sit down and no go through this with you. Uh, because I see you're trying to understand it, and they do understand that this is a difficult situation to understand all that stuff. And I want to help you, but no, sir. What he just said, though, you increased the girls' salaries. Okay, well, let me talk about that. So he's right. Right. He, he's right. Um, BNF also, quite, and again, I don't want to make this about an individual, and that's what I was trying not to. But it's a number that equates to what your budget is. But, but hold on. But let me answer that. And, and again, it's the GM's budget. And we did question that also, Slovakon. Let me answer this. Okay. 
Now I gotta remember what the heck I was. We, we did question that. Um, and I don't understand, and, and I've been wanting to say this. Director Slope Dodge did during that course of that year, with that big deficit, he did try to adjust the changes, everything that he did say. I want to substantiate that as well as this. As far as when you voted on the budget, that's separate, that's yours. I'm not going to comment on it, but I want everybody to know, and I want you to know, because I think you need to hear it from somebody else. Yes, you did try to adjust all those changes and everything. I saw it firsthand. As far as the payroll, I mean, what I'm trying to tell everybody is this situation that this board was put in today and the way this is done, it's hard to do this. And that's unfortunate, and they are trying to solve it the best they can right now. This is what I'm trying to get everybody to understand. They were put in this situation, they're trying to piecemeal it, myself included, if they're asking me questions, it's hard to do it without looking at the whole piece. Does that help you? Does, but you have to grow in a big point there. In 50 years of redundancy, you should make it simpler, easier, right. and less fun. I'll tell you what, that's okay. One more comment, and then I want to move on, because I won't close the comments. Sir, go ahead. Thank you. I've, I've lived in the Pines for 13 years, and all I've seen, candidly, is uh, everything. Uh, I'm not getting my money to this far. Name, name and address. Sure, my name is Howard Smith. Address? Okay. Uh, 10 Mayflower Court. Okay. Right around this corner. Um, I've lived here for 13 years. I've seen my trash prices go up. I've seen they don't pick up my leaves anymore. Blah, 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 blah. A whole lot of stuff that has not been done. I got flooding going on and on the sides of my house because, of, you know, there's just, I'm not getting my money's worth, that's for sure. They may be getting it on the other side, over on the water side, they may get the club where, all, where they lose a couple million dollars and pass it off on us again. I, uh, we have a demographic here that's on fixed income. Maybe nobody's looking at that. We have, now this is the first time I've been to one of these meetings, but apparently I'm appalled to know that we have a staff that has, they're getting their health care paid for. That's 1992. That is not today. Has anybody in this place looked at the state of, the, of this country? 28 trillion dollars and going up because we keep throwing money at it? That's what you guys are talking about. Throw more money at the problem. You gotta look at that. And, yeah, I, I'm getting a little bit excited about this. And, uh, I'm you're damn right. I'm damn right. I'm damn right. If people want to, you want to raise, want to raise, you want to raise another uh, what million and a half dollars to throw at what? No, uh, again, this is a this is a good reason for me to put a for sale sign on my property. Thank you. Right. Yeah. I just want to respond to this gentleman quickly. Um, um, sir, Yes. just want to let you know that the reason this discussion around the health benefits is taking place is because this board recognized this is a problem. So we actually are the first board, I believe, that has decided to attack the problem that's been going on for years. It just hasn't been... Why another? Why another study? Another study? You, to be, no, no, no. Hey, actually, I'm know, not saying. No, I'm not we saying. We have unused it. studies. Un, you know. Uh, I think you just need to give us some understanding that we, as a board, are actually tackling the problem that's been going on. Like you said, it's it's a '90s policy that that is no longer right. in existence. Okay, I'm, I'm going to close the discussion. Uh, on, this this on one payroll. one one comment. I'm going to close the discussion on payroll. First of all. Director Trennick's right. Remember last year we made it. We made we recognized this um, benefits issue. 
All right, and we reduced the uh, the hundred thousand dollar debt for the uh, the uh, uh, account, the HRA. Right? Right. right, we removed that. So to say we've done nothing is not really correct. Okay, I'm not we, saying that we inherited that particular uh, scenario of hundred percent payment a couple of years ago. All right, so the board last year took the first step, saved the association hundred thousand dollars, and we're having a continuation of that discussion this year. So to say we're ignoring it or to infer that we're not considering these conditions is not accurate. So we will continue to work on that. The other side of it too is, as I said about 30 minutes ago, uh, we've got the 5L study. Let's look and see what that does before we spend any more money. It may open our some eyes, but um, you know that's a, that's a task we'll need to take on collectively. So moving on. All right. I think we've got some more, we will have some more discussion amongst ourselves, but there was a couple of other topics. I know that bulkheads was one of the areas, uh, and uh, I will open the floor to my other colleagues here to say what the next item is on anybody's mind. Deficit. All right, let's talk about deficit. So uh, I'll get the first comment. So in deficit, the original concept was $71 worth of the assessment yes. was going to be used to pay off uh, $600,000 worth of assessment. Um, I'll cut to the chase. Uh, we had a um, uh, we had a suggestion that uh, uh, the original budget only use it for $100,000 in backload. The other uh, half million of that, uh, since we thought that, as not being an appropriate way to use those funds, uh, the BNF came back and said you should consider paying a, a third of it, uh, or approximately $334,000, uh, and use the um, uh, use and affect the assessment accordingly. Uh, we've also floated the idea of driving it down to 250000 in, in a way to reduce the assessment. So I think there's a couple of options on the table. One, obviously, unless somebody wants to say that they are in favor of continuing that $71 assessment to pay off $600,000 worth of that debt, I don't think anybody here was really still interested in that. So the idea of uh, either you know reducing it down to uh, 250 or 333, so uh, you know that's where we stand right now. And certainly, as we reduce that, that certainly will reduce the assessment cost as well. So, John, you want to weigh on that? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> slow the time, <laughs> and uh, slow the time will go right after me. <laughs> so, if we go back to the January 3rd, 951, no assessment increase within that. Embedded within that 951 was a 10% allocation of that 951, I believe, to go against the deficit. Now, some background history for everybody here. Last year, this board, or whatever, they voted $71, which comes out to $600,000, to pay off the $1.6 million deficit. So they paid down this year, we made sure that 600000 was allocated to reduce that deficit, brought it down to a million. As the CFO, and as history and Ocean Pines and consistency and the right way to do this, when doing the budget, that piece of the assessment, since it was in the assessment the year before at 71, only the board can touch that. That's almost like replacement reserve money. That was what I felt, and that was guidance from BNF. The board can change it. We can give guidance on how to reduce it. The guidance back in September from BNF, when we saw there were increases for deferred maintenance that the board was recommending, BNF, me in particular, said, "Hey, we have seventy-one dollars embedded in the in the assessment. Let's give some. Let's spread it out a little more." which would reduce the assessment for that piece, by the way, to help out for these other increases that I know would happen in the assessment. They agreed to spread it out three years. That was the guidance. So it wouldn't have paid off in a year and partial. Let's bring it down and spread it out to three years. That's what should have been there. And that should have been there on January 3rd, $951. It should have been broken out. Here's the assessment proposal by departments. Break out. Yes, the board now is asking me to put in deferred maintenance. Put that there. Yes, there's a payroll study. Put that, break it out. And then come down, have the $71 
there with a bracket under it to get down to the three years. That would have made everything transparent for everybody. You would have understood every piece's part, every piece's part on your assessment. This board would have been able to vote very easily and see everything. BNF would have been able to do their job very easily and to see everything and give you all guidance. That didn't happen. It was embedded in your assessment. 951, no increase. Brought it down to 10%. Now, I'm not saying at the end of the day it shouldn't be. And BNF has given guidance. But I'm saying, and what I'm going to say again is the CFO. CFO gives direction on how, to, how the information is given, how it's released. Sure, the numbers, they're the GMs. Board executes also. There's a reason why you have a CFO. There is a reason why we give direction and how it should be presented. When that is ignored, you have a no increase. 951 is set. <coughs> on January 3rd. You have major expenses still missing, and you don't understand where this money has been taken. You still have this million dollars deficit, which is now only is gonna be spread out, and nobody understands that. But you'll pay for that down the road. I'll pay for it down the road. Or another board will be sitting here, and they'll have to put a bigger increase. Now again, I'm not saying the deficit has to be paid, not saying it shouldn't. I gave guidance three years, possibly four or five years. That'll work its way out. Slobodan, I know, has different. No, I will smile because I know it's coming. That's okay if I smile, sir. Um, so that's where we're at. So we're recommending the three years, of course, when you have a 951 that went down to 10%, it's going to show an increase. But the guidance that BNF gave really decreased the assessment because it was at 71 and we're bringing it down to like 25. Doug, it's up. Everybody got all that? Okay. So slow but not yet. I know he. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go, go ahead. Still, Eckert, nine widows watch. I have eight people sitting in front of me that are volunteers for us. I want to thank you very much. Listen, our assessments, this 1.6 million that has to be paid back, who holds the note on that? That's us, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so we have to pay ourselves back to fund our reserve by the amount of that loss, correct? Per our bylaws, right? So couldn't we pass a motion for this particular issue not to do that? And then keep our assessments the same? Still fund it with the 951 with what we're paying now and then continue on in a forward manner. This will catch itself up with the same assessment. Well, I, if, no. if you're looking at me, I'll answer that. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the board, yeah, the board, so, and of course, we can go and pay it off 10% over the years. That's for the board to decide. Uh, you can do that. That 951, there's so many other expenses that weren't included in there that needs to be addressed. For instance, fire, the depreciation calculation. There's a couple other items I can't think of right now. Those items will increase at 951, but we owe the fire department, we have to pay it. They weren't oh, included. Yeah. So that has to be, but yes, to answer your question, can this board decide to vote to only pay that deficit 10%? Yes, they can, absolutely, and that break that out. Here's one thing I just want to point out on that. A big part of the budget are the reserves, and with all, with all the moving parts, with all the money that's gonna be in work plans for initiatives or whatever, I wanted to make sure that our reserves had a proper balance. Not too much, and certainly not go down below a certain number. We did that. Gene Ringsdorf, the work team for Budget and Finance, did that, gave that tool to all the board. With that, with all everything being said and done for this proposal, our reserves for replacement will come down to somewhere around three million. That's a little bit below what well, we gave us guidance back in June or whatever it was of trying to have maybe 22% in there or somewhere like that. But when we did a five-year projection, we believe we'll get back. So we got to take that all into play. You have the deficit, 
we have the reserves, we have a lot of spend, you gotta put that all into play. So in all, it is tight. You can certainly go negative if that's what this board wants to do. I can tell you this, I won't be sitting here, but you can do it. Um, so that answers your question is yes, they can go down to 10%, but you, you will not see, I believe at the end of the day, a 951 no increase in assessment because of all these other expenses that were not included in the 951. John, I hear you. I just want to make another comment. Do you realize, folks, in this community what we get for our 951? We get a beautiful community. We have an amazing parks and rec. We have an amazing uh, amenities. We have a bargain here. I know folks are on a, a fixed income. You check out some other areas and their fees, they don't even compare to what we pay here. And we get a lot more. And uh, thank you guys for serving for us because I think that you guys do an important job. And uh, consider not paying us back as much this year. Okay. So just to respond to CFO by all and just come to you. First, I wish you were treasurer two years ago, okay? Because uh, you're asking tough questions, you're doing tough things, you're making tough decisions, right decisions, and you're holding board in check from a fiscal perspective. But I'm glad that you're here this year because we are, you're helping us make the right decisions. So I just want to commend you for that. You're, you're helping us in our decision-making process. <laughs> now, not what I was expecting. No, 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 I'm saying this because I don't want him to resign. No, I don't want him to resign. Okay. I need him around. Now, the second thing I want, second point I want to make, and it's related to uh, Joe Reynolds and his comments about uh, uh, one of the director's uh, article in a newspaper. I read that article, and let me tell you what, I shared the feelings that my fellow co uh, colleague described in this. Um, I believe if our general manager has done a better job, um, I believe we wouldn't be having such a difficult discussions now. Um, lessons learned, okay, but I do believe that um, our challenge today has been um, much larger than I think it should have been. And um, so I shared a lot of that frustration with uh, what, what she conveyed in, in, in her um, interview. Um, I was very close to doing the interview myself. <laughs> but, but I, you know, I, I, think, um, I think it was probably not the right time. Now, third point, um, and, and this, uh, I want to ask our general manager a question. How would you expect us to finish this year financially? We're two and a half months away from a year end. Forecast for fiscal year ending yes. April 30. Uh, we're forecasting pretty much square, maybe 10 to 20 K either direction. Okay. Uh, it all depends really. I mean, we'll have numbers what, next week, I guess, for the month of January. Obviously, the, the big money time is in the summertime, so we're beyond that, obviously. But January, February, March, and April are the, are the difficult months on the on the revenue side. So it's going to depend on how long it takes out. So the swing is 25K plus or minus. Right. I'm going to ask uh, our CFO to give me the same, and I'm not going to hold you to it, but I'm going to ask you for the same. And now, wait, now, just to put this into context, why is this important? I'll tell you why. We are talking about listening to our CFO, how are we going to pay down the deficit? Five years, ten years, three years? How are we going to make that decision if we are looking at def ending this year with a deficit again? You know, because to me this is a reality check. Okay, if we are in a hole again, that means we're not doing something right again this year. And I want to know why. And I also want to know what are we doing in the next two and a half months to put the brakes to make sure we finish in red? Because, he, I'm sorry, in black. <laughs> Thank you for that correction. Strike that from a record. Uh, to finish in black. You know, and really this is, I mean, we should all be challenged. Because if we don't finish in black, yet we are asking homeowners to pay, to help pay for the deficit. 
that means we're really not managing this association properly from a general management perspective and from a board perspective. So please, can you offer me, can you indulge the board by giving us your best guess on are we looking at a red or black come April 30th? Red, red, red. Okay, so <laughs> let's go back. One of the reasons we have, I believe, we have the fiscal year that we do is so that all our major operations and everything is up front, so we should be able to forecast and see where everything is. And with that said, at this point now, the forecast should be pretty accurate since 90% of whatever has happened, so I agree with you there. As far as the format, as far as the forecast, from the CFO perspective, I requested that. When, in the four months that I worked at Ocean Pines, I did it on the back of an envelope, and I saw two things two summers ago. When I was in there, in fact, I think this is how I met Ted, uh, where I was looking at it when I saw the losses coming in. I said, we need to forecast this because I believe we can have a problem with cash, which we winded up having in a sense, just something for a couple of months where your operating cash may be way lower than what you needed, but you still had the reserve cash and we were eating into it. So hopefully everybody understood that. We put a tool in place now, our finance lead prepares it, he's doing an excellent job with it to make sure that we have the cash each month. As far as the forecast, I have to go with what he's saying with the operations the GM is saying right now. I will definitely look at each number after this month, but the majority of the information is there, the operations are done, it should be easily forecasted unless something comes up. Um, so I'm gonna stay with what he's saying right now. Okay, so, so thank you for that assessment. And, and the reason I ask this is because I would encourage you come February 16th, if you have some preliminary numbers, right. uh, to advise the board whether we need to make some important decisions, operational decisions, to instruct the GM to make sure right. in the next two months we do whatever it takes to make sure that we report right. results and, that are in black. And I agree, that's, that's my role. And I've already spoken to our finance lead uh, yesterday. I told him I was coming in this week and that was one of the items I wanted to look at really in detail because it will affect us in, in the decisions that have to be made and we talked about that, yes. And the final point I want to make on the deficit, and, 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 and this is going back to you know, last year's assessment being at 951. Um, I'm on record with, the state, with stating that I wanted to stay at 951. Um, and, and the reason for that is um, very simple. Maybe I'm exaggerating that part. <laughs> um, it's because this board, or board in general, needs to do more work to get uh, the fiscal, uh, to get our house in fiscal order. Um, we also haven't done some, uh, some trimming, uh, some um, cost-cutting measures. Uh, I'm glad that Frank Daly, um, and as you know, I also spoke about this, uh, requested across the board cuts, 2.5%. Um, that was actually turning to a board directive. I hope those are not homeowners getting ready to start here. <laughs> so, 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 uh, you know, if you look at two and a half percent cut, that's about what three hundred and twenty thousand um, dollars. On the whole thing. Yeah, on the whole thing, three hundred twenty thousand dollars. That's pretty much. Okay, three twelve. That's about thirty-five dollars per homeowner. Okay. So, so if you start. That, and that, I'm talking about minus $951, okay? If we keep it at that level and then start subtracting what is what I would consider a fiscal conservative actions by the board. Before you can start adding, I want to see subtractions. I want to see that 2.5% across the board, $311,000. That means going from 951 to minus 35 do the math, that's 916, 906, uh, yeah, 916. So, and then, to Marty Clark's point, look at the peril. We have peril that's just out of control. Let's address that. We have another directive passed by the board that directed the GM to provide a cost comparison between using external contracting services and in-house on drainage, on landscaping, and other things. We don't have that information yet. So we don't know if we were to outsource some of this work, 
Are we going to save hundred thousand? Are we going to save three hundred thousand dollars? What are we going to save by addressing the payroll issues? You know, this is the heavy stuff that the easiest decision this board can make is approve a fifty dollar increase. That's the easiest. Collect from the homeowners. I want to see subtractions. I think it's not just me. I think all of us should be challenged with looking at ways where we can save. And that's why I feel that it's doable, that it should be no more than 951. We should do the subtractions and then let's have a list of things that must be done this year, must be added. Because if they're not, the sky is falling. Okay? Yeah, if, if, the, if you lost a, a mile of a road, you got to rebuild it. But other things are not mission critical projects. Nobody's making a call and saying, Houston, this is mission control, we have a problem. <laughs> so, Lena, I, am, I really am doing this in as, as, as forthcoming way as possible, but I want us all to be challenged to, to do maybe what this board is capable of doing. Because we have a lot of people with business backgrounds, a lot of experience, and if we can do it, with our collective experience, how do you expect any other board to do it? Order of details. The devil is in the details. Okay. Order of details. What was the three hundred and ten thousand dollars? Was it peanuts? Excuse me. That has the board. All right, I want to talk deficit, and the first thing I want to say is to talk a little bit about, you hear numbers that are thrown out there a lot about we have X amount in reserves, and just use reserves to pay off your thing. John's already talked about if we do what we're supposed to, we're going to be down to around that $3 million. But I want to read one thing, which is just as an information thing as to why budget and finance and the board separate reserves from operating. And this comes right out of the... CAI, which is the Community Associations Institute, the treasurer must clearly understand and help the board and members understand that reserves are for future major capital expenditures. They are not alter alternative operating costs. They should not be used for contingencies nor considered excess cash available for emergencies. Now, we have done that. We did that last year when we ran out of operating cash this board, by a majority, agreed to use reserves uh, for a portion to fund us operationally until new assessments come in. But we really have to get to the idea of looking at operating different from reserves. Both of them have to be managed. Now, let me move to the deficit, which I think is what we were talking about at some point here. Um, I, I, I favored, if it were my operation of my business, I would be following John Viola and budget and finance by paying a third, a third, a third. But I can live with either dividing it over four years or five years, okay? Which is if it's over four years based on a $20,000 loss, I'm going, Gene, based on what you had done on the deficit thing, would be about uh, 258 a year to pay back over four and 206 over five. Um, the other thing I want to point out is while we put away, you know, $600,000 towards deficit last year, that wasn't all an assessment increase. Remember, we cut operating last year by about, I think it was $28 or $29 out of the operation last year that then went along with the increase towards the deficit reduction. So it wasn't all increase that filled that 600000 It was also about $28 per homeowner cut in operation. So uh, my position on the deficit is that I can go with either four or five years. I am also understand that if suddenly the yacht club does well and suddenly we sell 19 lots we own and suddenly you know, the sun comes out for 15 weeks in a row and everybody makes money, that's just going to save us down the line. But hope is not a plan. We've got to go with what we know today and act on that. And if things turn out better, great. If they turn out worse, we won't have dug ourselves into a deeper hole. And so I can go with, you know, uh, personally, I, I like three, but 
I also understand we're trying to get a lot of stuff done, so four or five would be fine with me going forward. So from a BNF perspective, I mean, we've talked about this, Ted, and, and, and we like to give ranges. Three to four, we want to go five, or this board feels the need to do that, so be it. As the CFO, it needs to be broken out. It needs to be transparent. That budget started off with $71 in there, which was board edict last year, and then a bracket getting down to whatever you pick, four or five. As long as we're paying it down, we're doing something. BNF is fine with that, and we've been consistent with that, and I've spoken to many of you. Um, so. And earmark, and before I forget, we've talked about this, and I know Frank's going to jump in, so if the, the, the yacht club does start making money from banquets, BNF and the CFO saying that money should be earmarked, this board should state it now to first pay down this deficit. So it's not used for something else or some boondoggle or whatever. I hate to use that word. But we would like to see that. And I know Frank said that also. So yes. So, a couple of things. Number one, I'm glad you brought that up there because I, I, I wanted to mention as well. Remember last year, we did cut quite a bit out of the operating environment in order to balance the payback. Okay, so we knew that we had to do a lot of work. My question, if you think about that, and, I, and I've thought about the question, what are we not getting now, or what do we have the, no longer have the ability to do because we made that? And I don't have a tangible reference, but I've been thinking about it in, in the sense that we took 2.5%, and that's, those are tangible dollars. What's the intangible or tangible services or other offerings that we're not doing right now? And I think that'd be an interesting uh, you know, piece of information to have. The second question would be, and while I agree in concept with it, you know, what, what more do we trim, okay, without affecting the services offered to the community? Uh, that's that's an area that it's easy to say, yeah, let's take two and a half percent, let's take three percent, let's cut this, let's cut that. But at some point, it's the law of diminishing returns, where I take a cut, and now it, it's now felt in a tangible way by the association. And so I I certainly would not want to be put into a situation where we'd say, well, um, you know, we wanted to keep the assessment under control so the following services will no longer be offered. I, I don't think that's the way we uh, are being responsible in running the association. I think the responsible part is to make sure that people understand it's an important service that needs to be offered and the cost between year one and year two went up one, two, three percent, all right, and those kinds of things we have to take into consideration. Uh, with regard to the deficit, my other real concern is, and I'm in line with Ted, I, I'd rather pay it back sooner rather than later, because as we all know, boards change, okay? We're going to make this decision now, and next year a board could come in and basically undo what we, we've done and say, nope, we're not going to pay it back, and we're just going to carry that loss on the balance sheet, you know? And I know that our CFO won't be there uh, to help us anymore because he's already stated that. So. The idea of trying to make sure that we address this in a way while we can A, recognize it, and B, act on it is a little more important than trying to save, you know, $7. And I guess, and I should have this calculation, but I'll tell them myself, the difference between three three years and four years is how much on the assessment? About six bucks? All right. So the idea would be... No, what's between three and four? So we pay it back in three, we pay it back in four, we, we save X amount of dollars on the assessment. What's that number? It's not a lot of money. Yeah, so yeah, the, the idea here is, I think, to be fiscally conservative, you know, and not lose sight of the fact that we do indeed have to address this, uh, this deficit. Uh, you know, I prefer to look at it in a, in a three-year increment, again, uh, because it's fiduciarily responsible and the notion that you know, other boards could come in and basically change that, and then you'd have another set of services. And I just, and I just have to, to make sure this doesn't get translated wrong. In, in no way am I saying do what I do in a certain way, or I'm not going to be here. That's not what I'm saying. And I, what I'm saying is this: if whatever board or whoever makes the decisions here, if we take this association negative, which is reserves, everything else. Forget about the deficit. All right? If we take this negative, which you can, you know. I just don't want to be a part of that because I'm going to be the one sitting here explaining to the next board when they have to raise assessments on why we didn't do something. In no way am I saying do this or not. No, no. I'm here. Believe me, the seat's kind of hot, but it's fine. Um, and we've never had it before, and I want to do this. So please, it, it, that's not 
I don't want that to get misconstrued. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take my friend's statement. I meant it as a metaphor. Yeah, yeah, but, rather, but the things right. just, right. Right. in no I, way I, I will be. Yeah, yeah, okay. Frank. A couple of things. First, um, like my counterparts, I would feel more comfortable getting rid of this deficit sooner rather than later because it's your money that was blown and now we're trying to recover it so there's things that we can do for the community that should be done that haven't been done okay but like i also said i pay an assessment too and i received my marching orders from my boss to keep the damn assessment as low as possible okay and i'm not a dumb guy so i'm gonna follow those orders but a couple things I can go with, I can go there four years, would prefer not to go to five, I could do that, okay? Second thing, what I've talked with my associates here on the board about, we have some land, okay? Not six months from now, not nine months from now, not 11 months from now, tomorrow, we should put that land up for sale with an earmarking the proceeds of that land to go for deficit recovery, okay? Us holding land is absolutely no value to you as a homeowner. Nobody's paying an assessment on it. It's an asset that we could turn into cash to reduce your assessment, and it's not being done. And there are two pieces of land and two types of land involved. One involves residential lots. The other is a potential commercial property. That one we should have appraised and then put it up because residential lots are relatively easy to sell through brokers commercial lots we're dealing with people that do it every day and we don't and we'll get taken if we don't know what the heck we're doing that's the bottom line that should be done immediately okay to and it won't help with this year but it might reduce the hit next year okay and that's the other thing you know being physically conservative means this Taking what's required to run the association effectively and maintain the assets without taking a penny more. Okay? I want to point out something. As Sobodan pointed out, I asked that this document be done. I think it should be sent to everybody. If you're not aware, in 2020, we are projecting, collecting about $300,000 less in assessments than we did in 2015. The actual assessments have gone down 3.5%. That being said, this year alone, we're talking about a 9.4% increase in payroll. You don't have to be real smart to figure out those numbers go upside down real quick. And as one very noted national politician said, you don't learn a lot from the second kick from a mule. Okay, here's the danger in kicking things down the road and not addressing it. It's like you, you and your car with Jiffy Lube. You don't want to spend 50 bucks for an oil change, so you do it 10 times in a row. You save $500. Your check engine light comes on and you have to spend 3000 If you don't think that happens in this association, please stick around after the meeting and I will personally walk you to the second floor of the golf clubhouse where we're looking at somewhere around 1.5 to 2 million dollars to replace something that was permitted to deteriorate into dust in the name of keeping the assessment artificially low plain and simple if you don't if you don't give a rat's rear about the golf walk over to me to the beach clubhouse where you can see the second floor leaking windows okay that's going to damage that facility and you know why it's done? Because if you look through this thing and you have any, any, any whatsoever instincts on running a business, we have lost our way. There are things here that are totally out of control and things that should be controlled simply aren't being done. And it's time to change it. Just quickly, I, I agree with you almost 100%. One thing that I totally disagree with you on is that we should not be looking at selling what you said is our commercial property. The Ocean Pines Association is in perpetuity. 
We have no idea, for example, what we may need that land up there on 589 for. To sell that now for a million, two million, whatever it's worth, is short-term gain and long-term pain. This board should be looking at long-term as well as short-term and selling. It's like selling your inheritance of your parents. We should not be doing that, Frank. We should not be doing it. Sell those individual lots, amen. But to sell that property in 589 or to sell property over there at the beach, I don't think you ought to think about it. Not an individual. Point well taken, Joe. Okay. Just, um, I'd like to respond to uh, my fellow colleague, Frank. Uh, I have a lot of respect for his business background, but I will have to disagree with your recommendations on the land. I'm glad Joe brought it up. And it's a very simple reason, not that the concept is wrong, but because I believe what you have introduced a band-aid solution to actual problem. Right. What do you do when you, when you don't have any more land to sell? Right. If you look at audited financials since 2011, <coughs> I, you know, I got up at 4 o'clock this morning so I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, yeah. Operating balances every year have been negative. What we have today is not new. We've been having this problem historically, at least from what I was looking at since 2011. We haven't sold the land. So, with all due respect, I, I disagree with you. We should not sell lots. We should not sell a group of property on 589. And if we do, if eventually we do, this should be a homeowner's decision. Um, and it should be something that's based on our strategic plan that will articulate to us what the homeowners want, what this association needs to look up to like 20 years from now uh, to attract buyers, to increase the value of our homes. But that is really the most important thing. We all own homes here. We all want the value of our homes to grow, not, not to drop. So um, um, I think I think I, I said enough on, on, on that point, um, but I, I, I would totally be against it. Two. Okay. All right, um, Joe, I actually agree with you. Um, Frank, I can't see selling an asset. It's like um, people, there's companies that come out and they want to buy your lawsuits. And they want to buy your lawsuits for 50 cents on the dollar when it pays out to get it. it to, to deplete our assets, um, basically our money in the bank is how I look at, the, at this property. It's our money in the bank, it's your savings account, it's our, it's our, you know, our inheritance, so to speak. Um, I hate to disagree with you. I understand where you're coming from on it as the thought process, but I'm afraid of depleting everything we have, leaving us with nothing. So I do have to disagree with you on this as well, I'm sorry. First of all, Slobodan, I applaud you that you go back and you're checking the numbers. I do you know you do a lot of work on it. And, and you're, you are right. There have been numerous years where there was a operating, what's called a loss. Um, but, but what caused that? And, and granted, I understand about expenses and we have to curtail that. I believe in zero operating growth and, and, and certain things like that when you have the benchmarking in place. But what happens is, whether it's boards, whether it's the GM, or whatever. I mean, they want to keep the assessments flat, and they don't reduce costs, as you're saying, or, or whatever. And then sooner or later, it all builds up, and we have these losses, and somebody wakes up and sees that we don't have the cash. We have cash, but you know, you may be dipping into reserves to pay for operations, or you may not even, your reserves are lower, because you haven't looked at it, you don't have the tools that we're putting in place now, to give the board to make decisions. And then somebody comes up every five or six years and says, we need a deficit recovery. And then you put that out there, and in that year, it is a big hit to the assessment. And then it's the person that comes up with that that gets, you know, we, we ride out of town or whatever. But it's a buildup of all those years, like you said. And, and I don't want that. And, um, but it starts with the budget process, is what I'm saying. And so. Yeah, just, just to respond to, to, to John Ayala. Um, you know, thanks, Doug. Um, you know, we spoke about the deficit issue, and I think um, when you had your committee work session, I asked um, for basically best business practices. I asked, for example, 
instead of debating do we pay it down, do we not, you know, let's see what is industry doing, generally speaking, you know. Um, just because we roll the deficit forward, is our credit rating going to go down to C plus? Are our bonds going to no. disappear? No. We're not going to be able to sell right. our bonds now. And I'm not trying to make light of the situation, but it, I'm trying to put it in a perspective, you know. And I, and I think if we are going to address it, uh, we've got to address it in a way that I believe is very conservative, not aggressive, simply because simply because keeping deficit on the books doesn't affect us from the way we run this place. It does challenge us to be more fiscally conservative and accountable. Um, and that's why I would like to see, you know, with this board, how do we end the year, and also to see how we, how we, do, how we do next year. Because, it, it, like I said, I believe this board has, the makeup of this board is such that with right decisions made now, I hope next year we have surplus. Is surplus a bad word? No, everybody's talking about losses, everybody's talking about zero-based budget. But I think if we, you know, do things right, I, I would, I think we could have surplus next year. I, I'm not going to be on the board to, to see that happen or to make, to make help that happen, but um, What's wrong with the surplus? Just like you have nothing. Remember, we're not for profit, but nothing. I hope we do have it. Hey, look, it's in the hands of the board right now. You got plenty of guidance. Obviously, you don't have to pay it back. I mean, you're just rehashing it now, slowing on, so it's up to the board. So, yeah, on. <laughs> One more comment, though, uh, with regard to uh, uh, this is my third budget, but so that I think this is your third budget, so we've been through this process. Uh, several times. One of the other things that maybe we ask ourselves, and, and I like the word challenge, is that, you know, we've, we've ended up with a deficit in, in some way, shape, or form. And whether or not that's because we want to be very conservative with the assessment or because we have inefficiencies in the operation, we need to define that. We haven't done the, the traditional root cause analysis of exactly, you know, doing that introspective look at how our operation runs as maybe another tool to look at how we are addressing the assessment. Now, everybody on this board knows I am a big advocate of not being part of operations, of being very hands-off and, and playing an oversight role. But part of the oversight role is to make suggestions to the operations side of the house to say, let's look at these kinds of things. Give me your assessment so when it gets to the board level, we have a pretty clear understanding of uh, you know, what needs to take place, whether or not uh, if we make a decision, it affects the assessment, so on and so forth. But that maybe one of the takeaways, and I know that I certainly would be an advocate for this, is that let's, let's maybe put together some kind of initiative that says, look at the kinds of things we are currently doing and whether or not they're sustainable at the same rate whether or not they're providing value to the organization for the investment that comes off of the assessment, and whether or not it's, uh, you know, sort of something that really we adds to the overall value of being part of Ocean Pines. So one of those kinds of things where, you know, we talked about this outsourcing, a specific, you know, particular aspect of an operation, is that really a money saver? Well, I don't know, because we haven't done that analysis. So all of that... All of that operational analysis, I think, would help next year. Now, certainly, it's not going to help this year, but again, one of the things I like to do when we ever have an, an open conversation like this is what are the takeaways? What did we learn? What, what kinds of things can we apply that came out of this discussion that makes sense for us to go forward? And, and by the way, one of the other big things that I do is, you know, when, when I'm no longer on the board, others, one of the responsibilities I take is what can we hand off to the new board that will help them? Okay, that'll that'll give them, you know, a, you know, a sort of a, a running start to, you know, the, uh, addressing the issues that they do. And I think that this kind of root cause analysis or an operational analysis, whatever you want to label it, uh, would be a, a step in the right direction. Not only for us to, you know, sort of self-evaluate and, and, and get a lot out of it, but sustain for the next board. So you reduce the number of variables as, as you as boards transition from one year to the next. So um, I know we got a couple of folks that want to make comments. Let's have two comments and then let's move over, over into reserves. Good morning, all. Lou Williams, 78 Teal Circle. Uh, first of all, problems are temporary situations. We can solve them if we just come up with the right solution versus catastrophes. We talk about a lot of problems that we have. I know you all inherited some things that you didn't want to inherit. 
that's part of the nature of the position that you took. Transparency is the best in business, particularly when you're dealing with residents. If it's going to be an increase, if you tell the residents we're going to have a $50 increase over a period of time, then people can prepare versus nickel and nine of them every year. I think 40% of our community is retired on fixed income. That has to be a consideration because we're talking about being sustainable and having the type of community that we, we want to have. We have a CFO who I've listened to a few times, seem to be very knowledgeable. From what I understand part of the conversation, some people's not listening to him. Why? If you have the expertise among you, why not? Why do you look for outsource to get some answers? Case in point, um, we have a GM. He's selected by, I guess, us. So now, if he's a problem, we can't blame anybody but ourselves. And so, if you like him as a person, and I'm not just using you, I'm just saying period, do you work with the person if they have the potential? If not, we have to, we have to eat that. But I think we have to take into consideration our community as a whole. Apparently, it looks like we're doing some, some other people have done some things wrong that we have inherited this baby. Now we have to figure out how we're going to deliver this baby and grow this baby to be what we want it to be. Thank you very much. John O'Connor took the over place. Mm -hmm. This is this is the twenty second board I have listened to go over a budget. In those twenty seven years I have spent fourteen of which on the budget finance committee. Uh, J B I think is the sixth GM we've had, not counting the temporary ones. Um, I appreciate all your time that you spend to it and John there are ways to resolve hot seats. They have cool things you can say. Uh, the only observation I have is we have been here over two hours, a little over two hours. I haven't heard of any decision yet on the coming budget. Yeah, I think it's time we start at least decide, make the decisions and move on. It looks like you're going to be here for the next two, three days. <laughs> Done. Point taken. Thank you. Uh, Jane Ringstore, by McAfee Court. I'm also uh, assistant treasurer. I did want to make a comment about um, deficits and the operating fund. Ocean Pine uses something called fund at UND accounting. Okay. There's three funds that represent our network. Which network? You have assets. Assets are things you own. You have liability. Map you owe, own, owe, and the difference is your network. That means unencumbered resources. What does it mean when you say, let's not recover a deficit? You're denying future boards the resources that you had to work with to make decisions for the community. When you say, I'm not, I'm just going to let deficits ride in the future, I'm not going to recover them. You're saying to future boards, I'm not giving you the resources I had to work with. So I'm just going to let it ride. So of the three funds that make up our network, the operating fund is the only one that's unrestricted. The other two funds are restricted in their use. So I just want to bring that out. Also, I don't know that this is a fact, but something in the back of my mind says if you want to solve any asset, you have to go to a referendum. Over a certain amount. Yeah, over a certain amount. So that's another issue if you yeah, I would just like to see us, uh, I'd love to see us make some decisions. I know we can't vote today. I would support a $250,000 four-year deficit recovery plan. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get a vote on this. And that would be a reduction yep. from last year's assessment. I'll show you. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Probably 30, 21. Yes. It would be 250. Right, but he wants it in dollars. How much is the assumption? So $89 would be 258. Let's let's also agree. We're starting from the the current 
recommended assessment of uh, was it 1078? Because right. mm -hmm. right. I mean that's kind of where you know the re again not the final the recommended budget we need to start. Our goal was to see what we can do and knock that back down. So, so can I just say something? I don't have the number, but you have it. So the original 951, this would be a small increase to it, but the 1078, there should be a small reduction to it. And he'll give you the numbers. Yeah. Last year it was $71. If we go with the 257779, it would be $30.50. So you'd be saving about 40 bucks uh, off of what we paid last year. It's no savings, but off of what we paid last year. Because then you have to take and take the 257 and subtract it from the 100,000 that was in there, so it actually will go the other direction. But it's it's a, it's less than half of what we used for deficit recovery last year. So, and, and, and I think, and I'd like to think, somebody in the audience, correct me if I'm wrong, see some, like some at least tangible estimates here, okay? In other words, now we're talking 1078, we just said, if we take this route, we're gonna reduce it by, what, 36 bucks? About 40 bucks. Okay, so there's one. So you have to go back to the fact that we only have hundreds in the budget. So it actually is going to be an inverse. Exactly. It's two phases. Exactly. That's been my point all along. Thank you, Chad. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I'd just like to throw a slightly different scenario to the deficit. Um, if this board um, is um, willing to, to uh, attack the deficit this year, um, I would be more inclined to look at a five-year as opposed to four-year. Um, and the second thing, I just want to respond to Gene, um, our assistant treasurer, and his comments. Um, and I recall uh, sometime last year, I think you offered uh, your, your thoughts on the deficit and uh, I think what you said is that if it exceeds $750,000, we should start thinking about how to address it. If it's below $750,000, let's see how we do. Um, so I kind of took that feedback into account um, and um, if we are going to fund it this year, I looking at one million as a balance and going over five years, then you have to address basically two hundred thousand dollars this year. How do you fund that? Uh, but uh, you know five is maybe better than four or three. So it, it gives it a softer it, well I'm sorry, are you talking to me? I'm, no, sorry, I'm talking sorry. to all of us. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you just happened to be sitting across. But I, yeah, I think, right. yeah, I'd like to suggest five years, and uh, and obviously I'd like to preface that by uh, our, our challenging ourselves to come up with uh, with the savings uh, along the lines that we discussed earlier, like across the board, two and a half percent cut. Yeah, my, my only concern with that is, you know, again, going back to my comment earlier about boards change, okay? So the difference between, you know, a five-year and a three-year is, you know, 27 bucks, okay? So is, what's the risk associated with that? In other words, we, I believe we would have higher risk of maintaining this five-year uh, agreement to ourselves to pay back versus the three. I think you reduce the number of variables. Yes, uh, it, it will certainly have a, a larger increase, you know, or a larger effect on the assessment, but you have to take into consideration the risk factor. I mean, you know, we talked about, uh, at least, you know, personally, how do we set up future boards, all right, to, to be sustainable, to be, to be able to continue the good work rather than going, like, you said, hey, uh, that's your problem. I, I politically had to say I didn't raise the assessment, so I made it somebody else's problem. I'm not built that way. I can't, I can't do that. I'd rather get up front and say, here's what we think we should do feasibly taking into consideration not only the effect on the assessment, but the risk associated with carrying something out over a variable of changing boards and changing personnel. I'm not disagreeing with you. Let's look at a big picture. Let's look at a picture in totality. We paid $600,000 already in the deficit. And what I'm suggesting is funded for $200,000 this year. That's $800,000. That means in two years, we'll have cut the deficit in half. I think that's very aggressive. Okay? So I understand your point, 
but that is you're looking at a single situation, a four year versus five year. I'm looking at the fact that we have already brought the deficit down by $600,000 this year. And if I, if you go with a five year plan, which means next year we're gonna fund it for $200,000, that means we have collected $800,000, cut the deficit in half in two years. I think that is a very aggressive and very good achievement, you know, which this board would, uh, would accomplish. I, look, we heard from two BNF members, Gene Ringsdorf, who explained to you about situations and, and uh, what it means going forward. I'm with John O'Connor. The CFO gave you the tool that you need to look at this. You've had it. Other boards have never had this tool to look at your reserves, to look at how everything affects it. We've, give, we've given guidance. I agree with John O'Connor. It's time for this board to make a decision and make it now. Because, you know, we're in the middle of February. And I'm encouraging this board to take a vote. There's nothing else that can be said here. What you're saying is four or five, it's in effect three, four, or five dollars. I mean, you have enough, vote on this thing. That's my recommendation right now. Oh, okay. We have three or four directors that would prefer to do it at three. We have some that say five. And to me, we ought to plug it in at four, and then when we get to next Saturday, take a look and see what the differential would be in the assessment to go five, and then we can argue it out. I mean, I, I think you ought to go four, and, you know, let's see what it looks like there at that point. I like three, but I'll go with I okay, I'll go with four ten, but I want to point out something to everybody. Does anybody think that we haven't had any inflation since the year 2016? Because if we just assessed at the same level that we did in 2015, I'm sorry, in 2015, we would knock two hundred and ninety-four thousand dollars off the deficit. All right. Reserve. Start with yeah. Start with, okay. Start with bulk. All right. We re we received an updated bulk uh, memo last night from the general manager, which shows that we will be spending approximately two hundred forty-six thousand dollars less than what was in the budget or any of the budget conversations through for this fiscal year that ends at the end of April. So uh, Gene Ringsdorf had done a tremendous amount of work on um, depreciation and on all of the reserve funds going forward and I had done some of, uh, he and I independently did bulkheads uh, to see how we matched up. So late last night I tried to plug everything back in. I think that now look and, and let me make sure because somebody mentioned the idea of how assessments are going to go anybody bulkhead costs are going up and everybody's going to be paying much more in assessments over the next few years and what we did when we looked at this was as a group that was looking at this we said for bulkheads at the end of 2025 we want to have a carry forward balance of 500,000 <coughs> Not of two million, not of a million, but five hundred thousand. And when we ran the numbers, we were actually in the negatives a little bit, a couple of times, um, and that was based solely on what was in the reserve fund. You have to remember that bulkhead costs have gone up about thirty percent, based on both. The, it's cost more for the the work, but also based on about a twenty five percent increase for not being able to use swim and racket. And that's an that's a very important point. People need to understand that. And one of the things that is coming out of here as a recommendation, I know we've already tried to talk about the water plant, but we need to find and explore another area in or around Ocean Pines that we can use as a staging area. Even if we rent it, we will save over time a tremendous amount of money because basically you go from the spend over the next five years if you look at the reserve fund is about 1.1 1.2 average per year but when you actually take the numbers that we're paying due based on this last contract we left it's closer to 1.5 so that's 
a tremendous differential that sits in there. So, all of that said is background and information as to how we get here. Looking at this, looking at everything we need to do, we could waive the 19 this year and still be able to hit. Gene, I stuck everything in again last night. So I, I stuck it in based on what the actual carry forward reserves from the GM said they would be. We could waive the 19 this year, keep the individual bulkhead in as what it is, and be okay. So that would be $19 coming off that, you know, 127. We could do that, and I feel confident. I've probably done more calculations on bulkheads than anybody in the world, but I will say this: everybody needs to understand that the cost is going up, and it will be going up. And the idea here is that there would only be $500,000 in it in 2025. So it's not like we're going to be building up some, quote, slush fund in bulkheads. But we could waive the 19 this year, and I'll send the whole board the revised calculation uh, tonight. Yeah, right. but Ted, agree with you 100%. Uh, the only thing I would disagree, I ran a calculation, again, about 5 this morning, between the contracted work currently from McGinty and the previous work from High Tide not using the swim and racket club as a staging area which is something that your fellow homeowners wanted and enforced okay for in their minds i'm sure very good reasons contributed to what is a 43.6 percent increase in the cost of dawn a lineal foot of bulkhead no no hold on so it is hold on let's go ahead Part of that is vinyl versus wood, too. Yes. Okay, so some of that is that no, no, we no, are no. putting part vinyl part in the contribution. So, as you said, they're going up, and they're definitely going up, and we definitely have to do some things. I know that there were suggestions made to maybe look at stainless <coughs> components to extend the life of bulkheads and look at a different staging area, but the cost increased dramatically. Good job. Good job. Um, let me let me first ask that a question I want to ask you to clarify um, I understand you're suggesting uh, waiving $19 uh, for 8,500 homeowners this year and what are you suggesting about waterfront homeowners differential pay the 425 that we paid the full differential yes sir. Okay. so um, 465, yeah, whatever that 465, is. 465, 456, whatever it is. So um, uh, let me respond uh, to the bulkhead issue in general, and then I'll be also very specific. Uh, we are looking at a uh, multi-million dollar infrastructure project, bulkhead replacement. 120,000 linear feet. If you look at current price of rounded to $300 a linear feet, you're looking at $35, $36 million project over the life of the replacement. Minimum. That's like laying 66 miles of roads, new roads through this association, throughout this association. What concerns me is how we have approached a 35 plus million multi-year project. We really don't have a project plan. We don't even have a sound way, financial instrument of what is the smartest way to finance this project is aside from just a simple differential that can go up and down, up and down every single year. Um, I don't even know if we have hired an independent inspector to spot inspect our bulkhead walls and tell us how many linear feet over the next five years needs to be replaced or next ten years? I haven't seen that information. This board passed a directive to the GM to split the bulkhead work into two separate contracts. One, a replacement installation, the other one, material and supplies, to see if we can gain better pricing on the material by purchasing or securing a multi-year contract from suppliers at a much aggressive price based on a very high quantity 
for say 10, 20, 30, 50,000 linear feet as opposed to 500 feet at a time. Single, single kind of a work in a location. We haven't seen that yet. So I understand we're all trying to do the right thing, but I believe some fundamental pieces of the information are missing. And um, I am I'm concerned with that. I'm concerned whether the staff, staff has done what needed to be done to give the board right information. Uh, we're still waiting for uh, certain things to be done by the GM, and we as a board are now trying to make um, a sensible conservative decision on the bulkhead. My personal view, just based on what I've seen the last past two years with the bulkheads and the work done, is I'm okay with $19 holiday, uh, but collecting uh, another 100% from the waterfront homeowners for, for this year for what I don't believe is a solid number, I'm really not so sure that is, uh, that is the right thing to do. Maybe we should cut that in half, 50%. And not because, uh, you know, it's, it's a nice thing to do, but because we have the information missing. I, at least, feel like uh, that we're just going down the bulkhead path and just replacing things. I would love to see if the, if the report exists, please provide it to me, from an independent inspector who basically came to this association and said you have 10,000 that need to be replaced over the next three years. You have another 30,000 feet that needs to be replaced in a year X, Y, and Z. We don't have that information. If any, if any of you do, let me know. I haven't seen it. So this is why I feel, again, this board is trying to make the best uh, out of the situation we've been presented with. That, that it's not going to create a problem for boards down the road. But yet, our duty is not to the future boards, our duty is to the homeowners today. And that is collect only, according to our declaration of restrictions, based on current and future and needs that is justified, that is documented. Uh, Stu Lackard, nine minutes watch. I don't know if this was mentioned before, I don't remember hearing it, for the staging area for our bulkheads. How about by the boat ramp? There are no houses over there. You can bring a barge right down that canal. You can use it as a staging area and you don't have to worry about the ice or front of everybody's house. So it's too, uh, we actually suggested that to the county way back when and we ran into some resistance in permitting. Uh, there was also consideration about the depth and, and the dredging that might be involved in order to, to secure that area for such an operation. So uh, it certainly probably needs to be asked again to see if anything's changed between, when, when did we talk to them? About six months ago? Yeah. Paul? Yeah. Yeah, about six months ago when we went and, and, and um, Nobody would complain it's in front of their house, I know that. Uh, true, true, but there, is, there were other considerations, and uh, you know, maybe we can get a better... Uh, anyway, oh, what's it? Gene? Uh, Josh, just as a point of information, I'm sorry. That's all right, I'll bring it to you, Gene. Hey, I'm not going to hold Oh yeah, that's why I moved to the park. <laughs> sorry. Um, the uh, just a point of information. Uh, this is for Slovenia. Oh, I'm sorry. Never mind. I'm, I'm, um, I'll hold. Okay. Can you hear me there? <laughs> if the uh, reserve study gives some idea of the replacements that are necessary, based on what was done by the reserve study engineers, it's not. You know, they didn't, they weren't contracted just to do bulkheads, but it gives you a general sense of uh, what should be replaced when based on so some of the information there be, what you're asking for would be a lot more specific i'm looking for a marine expert that knows bulkhead walls but but, but i am saying there is some <coughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. uh, gene to your point uh and, and for the board i think when for bulkheads roads for drainage and where applicable in the buildings that we're talking about building 
uh, I think we need detailed plans based on condition, based on lineal footage, based on schedules, uh, much greater than we've had to this point in time to work with that are reported on on a continuing basis. Because right now for bulkheads, there's a list of homes, not a list of lineal feet, not, nothing in regards to condition, nothing in regards to schedule, nothing in regards into, into cost. And we need that information. Yeah. Well, right. And, and I think it, they work together, Gene, because I think the idea behind the reserve study is... Yes. Yeah. Use, use one to generate the other because we validate what the reserve study says by the engineering plan and then you execute it because some things get pushed in, some things get pushed out. But we definitely need that if we don't have it. So we're like kind of, to a certain extent, with the reserve study, not shooting in the dark but we're not as precise as the kind of planning that we should have for the magnitude of projects we're dealing with. Sure. Sir. Um, one, one statement. The beach club, I do not believe we own that. I believe you people lease it, do you not? No. I'm sorry, you said the beach club. The beach club, no, we, we own it. You do? Yes, we own it. I used to use it all the time. They said the restaurant across the street the land. No, we lease them park. We have a parking agreement for them to be able to use the parking lot at night and when we're closed. So, okay. so we actually own the property and lease the secrets of the uh, use of the parking lot. Uh, well, they exist. You say you have, have parking lots that need to be sold? Are they wetland property or not? Some of them are real good uh, properties uh, as far as land and drainage goes. But are they're, they're, below they're, sea level? I don't know any of those below sea level. What is the sea level of this house right here? Sorry. Well, there's a lot right across the street from me, and been water in there for 15 years. Huh? Because I think I it's think federal, federal, uh, federal sea level property. Is that correct? I'm sorry, I, I... Lots that have water on them, 24, you know, all the time. Yeah. Uh, are they federal land? Because you can't build them because they're wetlands. No. Yeah, we, we, the way I understand it is we can't, we can't build or construct on, on uh, wetlands. Now, how the federal government, I defer to anybody, is more... Lots. Well, lots. 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 Okay. Okay. Okay, are grandfather. So thank you. Well, if somebody had put out the list of those properties, I might be willing to buy two or three of them. Well, there you go. But uh, if they're underwater, that wetlands, no, no one don't want them. See the general manager. Because you can't build them. You want to go down. You want to go down. Hey, 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 can you take that as an action item? Yeah. Sir, uh, Jay, Mr. Bailey will take that as an action yeah, item. We'll, we'll, we'll check some more next week. Oh, I, I can't come, come out and see me next week, and we'll talk about those lots. Where am I going to see that? At the office where you see these are other <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, more, more. <coughs> Billable lot, so. <laughs> uh, I would remind the board of directors that 10 years or so ago, five years ago, whatever, 10 years ago, I guess, in the effort to raise money to build a new community center that ultimately failed, the board of directors did an all court press local realtors, big advertisements, trying to sell our lots. How many do you think they sold after two years? Zero. Really? These lots are not particularly desirable. Anybody that thinks we're going to raise money selling these lots is a fool. Now, back to Balkans. I live on the waterfront. Um, the, the program here appears to be, and I don't really have any objection to it, is based upon the viable life of a bulkhead, which is give or take, what, 20, 25 years, that we, our program is essentially, we're gonna replace these every 20, 25 years. So we don't go around looking for a bulkhead here and a bulkhead there, and we're gonna fix this one, that way. If we have a failure, we go and fix it. But in terms of our bulkhead program, to my knowledge, we're embarking now on a, we're at the end of a re full replacement cycle, we are embarking on a new replacement cycle, which will cost, 
based on Frank's numbers now, in the range of 35 to 40 million dollars in today's dollars. Um, and that's the way it's going to work. I mean, I don't know how else you would do it. I mean, we need to hire experts to come in here and go look at every bulkhead in this community and say, oh, well, this one needs done, this one needs <coughs> At this point in time, I think the way we've been doing is appropriate. And the other way we've been doing in terms of the dollars is we allocate in the budget the amount of money that we anticipate spending on bulkhead replacing in the following year. And there's only so much that can be replaced. We're now working with two different companies, whereas we had one company that could do all our work for 30 years or more. Now we say we need two companies to do the same work that one company did. I'm not sure what that's all about. But the $19 that everybody keeps mentioning for those who aren't aware of it, there are two kinds of bulkheads in ocean ponds. One is in front of individual homeowners' lots, and the other of bulkheads in front of common properties around the golf course, etc., Pintail Park, you name it. I'm not so sure why we're dropping, Ted wants to drop the $19. I have a feeling that it's a panic move hey, here's $19 we can chop off of that 127 right now. Let's, let's, let's grab that. That's easy pickings. Um, I'm not so sure we ought to be doing that. If we, if we are not uh, decreasing the amount that individual people are paying, why are we decreasing the amount that all of us pay? I mean, the logic escapes me there. We either need the money or we don't need the money. And I, I'm afraid the board is, is on the verge here making decisions based upon not what we need, but how do we eliminate the 127? And there may be ways to do that. But I'm not so sure it's in the bulkhead and things like that. There are, there are structural problems within the budget that you're all aware of, I know John is absolutely aware of, that are not going to be solved in one year. And um, I'm not so sure what the answer is, but I'm not so sure we're going to be eliminating the 19 bucks of bulkhead. Yeah, and, I, and I, the only reason I was in favor of that, Joe, is because I took the numbers last night where we weren't going to be doing a quarter of a million dollars work this year that we were supposed to be doing before the end of April, and all I did was go back in and re-plug those numbers into what we had done when we had both the 19 and the 465 in, and we're still able to maintain that balance of a, other than one year when we had the problem either way. But assessments have to go up, so you have a really good point now. Do we go ahead and hit the 19 now, and that's going to have to go up next year, just as the 465 is going to go up, and reduce that going forward, or do we make the cut because we want to save that part of the 127? I appreciate that work. However, 43% increase in per foot of the bulkhead, 43% more money, and you want to lower the amount we're going to collect. That makes any sense to me. Any more discussion on bulkhead? Yeah, I'll make a comment. I, I think that we should just leave the 19 in, and I would like to really see that we take Slobodin's recommendation and see if there are ways that we can do our bulkhead program uh, more efficiently and more cost effectively. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, the notion is sound, but then again, you know, we're paying, you know, how do we fund that study? You know, what's the timing of it? How much is it going to cost us? What's the net value? Because, you know, I got a copy of the reserve study right here on the bulkhead. We've got a pretty good and pretty detailed plan of how the, uh, the reserve study laid out what needs to be done. That, to me, is the heavy lifting. Uh, I don't know that we need somebody else to tell us exactly what it is that we need to do, because we already know, based on the reserve study, what we need to do. Uh, we agree with Joe, we've kind of come full circle now. You've got, you know, if you want the reserve studies available, the reserve study, you can take a look at it in the, uh, in the admin building, but it points out by property, you know, an address, how they're going to, you know, fill the, uh, or how they're going to replace the bulkheads every time. I think the only variable, at least in my mind, I'm certainly no expert, but the variable would be the emergency, you know, where something happened, the sinkhole, et cetera, et cetera. We have to be able to fund that as, as an unbudgeted expense in some way, shape, or form. So certainly keep that in mind, you know, as, as we, you know, consider what things that uh, happen and occur that, you know, can affect the budget. So, uh, any, any other comments? Over? Yeah, I'd like to make a final comment. Um, it's back to uh, Frank's uh, uh, projections on, uh, on the fact that um, about 25% 
um, is going to be additional uh, equivalent uh, cost to the bulkhead replacement program by changing the staging location. That's about over six million dollars. So, you know, it's back to what we talked about a few months ago, and we have basically challenged the staff to look at the alternatives. We talked about uh, what the Army Corps of Engineers does with uh, using uh, barges as a staging area and uh, locating material out in a river. Uh, it's being done. We, look, we talked about a temporary staging area on land where we can stock, pile the inventory, and then just move material to a job site when that happens. Um, so there are alternatives that in the long run can be more cost effective than the projected six to eight million dollars. I mean, you know, Steve, you're the engineer, you know, Frank, you're the engineer. And these are the things that we haven't done yet. And I think for that, it, it, it behooves us to challenge the staff to look at the alternatives as we go forward so that we make sure as a board that we have selected the optimized way to address our staging location issues. Make sure that we are moving ahead with a replacement program in the most cost-effective way possible. Yeah, I, I again, bringing concept, although uh, I would argue that uh, if we had, uh, you know, sort of an uprising based on storing uh, materials at, a, uh, uh, at the Swim Racket Club, you'd have just as much, if not more, if you had materials stored, you know, on a land-based site, you know, because you get, uh, you know, uh, truck traffic, you get, uh, you know, unusable space, et cetera, et cetera. We'd have the same, you know, issue per se. But I think it, it sort of begs the notion that I mentioned earlier, and that is, you know, look at overall operational analysis. You know, what kinds of things we know we're faced with this notion of uh, about a 25% increase based on the lack of uh, ability to uh, use the staging area uh, to swim the racket club. You know, what are the other solutions? We're not going to solve that today. Uh, I think, you know, based on our discussions, we have a, a sense of what we want to continue in, in the budget with regard to bulkheads. But uh, again, I go back to challenge board saying, let's take that as a takeaway and go, what kinds of things do we do going forward? Because we know we have to certainly go back to the county and ask what they think. Uh, and, you know, could Whitehorse Park again? You know, maybe it's only. Uh, I'll make up numbers, 20 grand to dredge out the uh, White Horse Park to be able to use it. Don't know. Let's go find that information out and see if it's palatable, see if it's something that we want to take forward because we can turn that 20,000 investment into some savings against that six million that we know we're going to spend. So more information, more analysis, more study needs to be done on that, but we're certainly not going to solve that today. Um, all right, are there any other open issues we wanted to talk about with regard to the budget? I'm so I, I think we need to talk about the, the big whack in there, which is the roads reserve, uh, which is... is uh, is forty-seven dollars and thirty-three cents of that increase? That's my big item here. <laughs> so, <coughs> and those comments, John. Anything? Okay. So the, the roadrooms reserves um, last year, BNF recommended to put, talk about the, the fiscal right now recommended to put money in there for the roads, believing that let's get some idea what is needed see what it costs there are certain pieces of the roads that we believe we were told needed to be corrected I thought that was a good idea that money was subsequently used rightfully so by the board for the forensic audit it certainly took uh, preference over it um, with that we gave guidance back in September same thing roads fund folk roads depreciation um, I myself I can't talk for the whole BNF right now the more I looked into it the more I see what's going on, the amount on the GM's plate, I felt that that road depreciation, maybe we don't fund it this year since there was so many other items, again, preference over that. Um, so BNF, myself in particular, I know I spoke to several of them, we're okay with that. We actually had it in one of the meetings when we were going through the reserve, start, the, the reserve calculation that uh, Gene did. We said to the GM, hey, maybe you got a lot on your plate now that we're seeing this, maybe we put that off so we don't fund it in case you don't get to it. So that's what BNF is right now, um, based upon all the projects or whatever you want to call them, initiatives. Maybe that may not happen this year, so we can wait another year on that. 
Yeah, and, and, and the information I have, I think everybody has, is that the, the, contra or the suggested contribution to Rose Reserves uh, is a, a $47, you know, charge against the assessment. The question I had and I wrote down earlier is, you know, John, basically the same thing. You know, we've got a lot on our plate. We've got a pretty aggressive and, and you know, maybe really uh, overly optimistic approach to uh, you know what we can get done this year. And the idea is, and I always think in terms of priorities, is it does it make sense for us to do that, or can we uh, can we live with the 300? What was it? What do we get from uh, casinos? About 300, 350 k. Yeah, 325. So could we live with that and not really worry about you know carrying that addition to the assessment? Uh, and in essence, and very simplistically, you know, not increase the assessment by the forty-seven dollars for collecting for road reserves. I mean, that's really what's going on. Right. Yeah. All right. So again, can we live with that current contribution to really take a look at this one and say that's a that's a big hit? It's forty-seven dollars. We certainly are. Uh, I don't believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Gene and and, and John, that uh, if we if we don't do that contribution, we won't be in at any risk of getting the reserve limit below that comfort level, you know, that area that we wanted to talk about. So, and if we do, you know, we just make a conscious decision to say, you know, I, we, you know, we live with it, but I think that's that's okay. one of the areas we have to talk about. The balance now of the reserve at the end of fiscal 1920 is 543,000. You take the 400,000 now. So, he's got the drainage coming out of there. Yeah. Right. So, that, that's, that is a point, and, and again, why this tool was prepared uh, by the budget and finance team uh, led by Gene was so that the board would have this tool to see all this. So you're right in that sense that we would come below um, what is a guideline for the roads because of the drainage coming out of there also. But we believe we can live with it since we don't believe any of that work would be done this year. But that's up to the GM. If the GM says he's going to do it, that he can do it, with everything else, that's fine, and then you know, then you keep it in. Yeah, but um, and I, don't, I don't mean this, this to sound flippant, but if we're looking at assessments and we're, we're giving the oversight, maybe we say, yeah, it's great if you think you can do it. Maybe we just decide that you don't do it. Well, then on a preference, then that one would come out, which is what that I said before. Oversight. That would right. If you if you're going to list everything, then that one would be at, at the end. Um, gentlemen, is the possible have the lines where I live? There's nobody out watching the road. The red and arrow roads and. I like to see that yellow line down the middle. If you have an accent, I'll make sure I'm on my half of the road. Which, which? King Richards. I use King Richards. Okay. All that, all that self-average, there's no, there's no, there's no line in the road. Yeah, I, well, I can't commit to anything at this point because since we don't strike those roads, since we don't strike those roads already, then it's not considered something that we have to fund on, on the reserve side. It would be actually I'm saying, I'm capital. Like, I would like to see them. Yeah, well, I'm putting the middle of the road personally, but I'm just saying, keep that in mind. Okay, as, as and I hope this isn't a burden to the association, but a lot of times a lot of good things come up, a lot of suggestions. Uh, I always encourage people to send an email to directors at uh, oceanpines.org. It reminds us, hey, we had that conversation. Sometimes I make a note, sometimes I forget to make a note. So, But anytime you send a, uh, an email to that address, all of us get the same email at the same time. So. Uh, uh, then, uh, no computer. Then, 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 then call, then call JB. And, and no, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna put that out there. No, I appreciate it. So, for legal reasons, you're on a narrow road, mm -hmm. and people still look to fall all the time. They wander over the center line a little bit. Yeah. We have an accident. Yeah. Who's you? Yeah, point taken. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, point taken. Point taken. Thank you. Just thanks, Bob. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, what I'm gonna tell you. Thanks, Doc. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, John knows um, how I feel about the road depreciation. Uh, yeah, um, definitely. There's no road in Ocean Pines that has a center line. Um, I know that. Well, so uh, you know, and and uh, you know, to me, this is uh, this is what should be eliminated uh, from budget for this year. Let me finish, please. Sorry. Now, the other thing I, I just wanted to. Um, point out, uh, you know, the GM has provided estimates for uh, replacements of uh, main uh, culvert pipes in the neighborhood of $620,000. Uh, that's, yeah, that's a pretty high estimate. I, I don't know uh, whether there's any uh, you know, documented uh, pricing uh, quotes. Uh, so 
it remains to be seen when the actual project starts what the actual costs are going to be and how that's going to impact uh, our uh, reserve road reserve fund and whether that's something that should uh, whether those pipe uh, costs uh, should come out of the road reserves or not I don't know uh, that's again question of um, uh, the uh, the accounts and and what uh, uh, what's the best way to finance those? Uh, is, should it come out of road reserves or out of general reserves? Uh, the pipes, the culvert pipes that you're suggesting be replaced? They are a replacement, but they're not in the replacement. They've never been uh, allocated to the replacement reserve. So mm -hmm. um, and we can talk about the fact that the road reserve does allow for uh, funding to be utilized for drainage related activities, particularly pipes that go underneath the road. Right. In case the or dirt ditches that go along the no. each side of the road. No? no. no. Okay. Only, only pipes are actual infrastructure, okay. not for right. moving yeah. dirt. Right. So, in these three pipes, so three areas, uh, one of them has four pipes. So, I'll use an example over it like that. Uh, yes, thank you, Mumford. Uh, when you turn off the Ocho Parkway, there okay. are two, two pipes on the ingress side and two pipes on the egress side to connect that canal over to the storm management area. And those are the four pipes that have been failing over time. We just have never actually replaced the pipe and repair that type of thing. So, um, in those three okay. areas, and I think there's about 100,000 on engineering and 520 mm -hmm. for the actual pipe. So, you know, I'm, I'm totally in favor of eliminating uh, the road uh, depreciation for this year and uh, going forward next year, future years, I think uh, it would be great to have actual road uh, reconstruction or, or replacement program, multi-year program in place and I think next year it's going to make uh, the entire board more comfortable how to address funding based on documented program so that we're all comfortable when we set those, those rates you know, for the next year. Right. So, I'm sorry, because he had trust me. I just wanted to. I don't want to say Great. So, summary from BNF is this with the roads. In a work session, when we put together the reserve, this, this tool, valuable tool, um, we mentioned to the GM maybe we take out the roads and maybe you cannot get to that. I think what this board needs to do is ask the GM make sure that we're not missing something that he may know that we don't know on whether or not he does know this money because he, in that meeting he felt it was needed that's his right whatever I felt that with so much on his plate I'm gonna repeat again and the fact that this would not be a top priority from what I'm reading and hearing that we could take it out and also on a proposal that you know any recommendations that I gave to the board after this was that so I, I, I request that you ask the GM as far as being F, we, we say take it out. Okay. Go ahead. So I, I, I have what I hope is a very simple question. If we don't contribute to the road reserves, the 400K and the $47 worth of assessment, can you still replace those pipes underneath? Uh, yes. yeah, okay, very simple. Plain and simple. Okay? We got right to the point. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to belabor it. We can knock it off and we can still do that. We can fund it. Thank you very much. Let's move on. So. I fully support taking that $47 out, but in exchange, I want a five-year uh, paving plan so that we know what we're looking at in the future. Because, there's, like I say, you don't learn very much by getting kicked by the mule twice. JB, you want to say something? Well, I think another question is, <laughs> if, if uh, I don't understand what the, uh, Mr. Rainsworth was saying about the, the balance in that road reserve, we take that out. If we are concerned about that, um, you know, I, I still want to do the 620 that we have for the pipes. We have 633 for road paving. Now, if we want to back off some of that from that 633 in order to keep that balance a little higher, we can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't impact the assessment, it just impacts the balance that's remaining in that reserve. So if we, you know, if we want to say, well, JB, let's not do $633,000 estimated of the road of the paving, uh, and we ratchet back off of that and, and try and prior, prior, take those that are the you know higher priority uh, areas of the roads, and we just pay that amount. 
that helps the balance on the road reserve. All right, if, if we pull the 400 out at the end of next year, we're going to have 141,610 in there. And then the spends going forward, according to our reserve study, which we're using, Gene Hughes, is about $650,000 a year. So next year, we would have to contribute to be break even in there, about 176. And that's without any inflation factor in there, because he did it two ways, one with an inflation factor, one with us. And the next year, we'd be short 500, the next year, 800, the next year, 1.1, and that's only doing $650,000 a year in roads and pipe replacement and all of that. So we're good for next year, whether or not he's able to do all the 1.2 million, we're good. But just in the back of your mind, especially those that have longer terms here, remember that uh, that that is going to have to be. A, there's no hiding from it next year, even at only 650,000. And if he doesn't do some of it this year, if he only does a million, there's an extra half quarter of a million in there that we, we don't have to do. But it will come back at some point. So I'm good with taking it out, but there's no denying and the other thing is I am not in favor of not doing something if it needs to be done because that's exactly how we got into the problem with not doing it we have the money in there let's do it but remember you're gonna have to address this again 12 months from now yeah, and that's why I asked the question about whether or not if we don't fund it we can certainly get this done but I think it's important to let the membership know that we're addressing some dynamics that are happening this year with regard to all the influencers on the assessment and so we're making some moves right now that we think are fairly conservative but Remember, next year we're going to have to fund to that reserve, you know, in order to do it. And hopefully, we'll have made some uh, efficiencies in other areas to kind of offset that additional contribution to the reserve. That's a hope, and I hope certainly not a plan. But certainly, I think one of the things again as a takeaway is we've got to do a good job in the operational analysis, so we're much better prepared. No, that's the wrong word. So we have the ability to realize any efficiencies that we may identify, you know, and that translates in the budget. So um, if there was one more kind of sir, go ahead. Uh, yes, my name is Peter Oskarowski. I live at 21 Ivanhoe Court. Um, part of my question is a statement. Part of my question is seeking information. And um, so I live here less than a year, although I've been coming to Ocean Pines as a second homeowner since the early 90s. Um, just retired and uh, moved here full time in April of 2018. Um, one of the things that I think about, you know, the good news, bad news, my tax just went up uh, because my house is increasing in value, but the bad news is, is that, you know, um, I, I look at what I'm paying to Worcester County in, in taxes, and I see a lot of the benefits are mainly going to the school district. And a lot of us people are retired. And so one of the things I'd like to kind of see is what benefits do I get as a non-child, uh, you know, person or he's going to the schools from the county for my real estate taxes. So the first question I have is, are the, the roads in Ocean Pines dedicated to the county of Worcester County? Or are, they, are they built up to the standards of uh, the Department of Transportation specifications? Um, and are they dedicated to the township of, 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 of the, to the state? And therefore, they are obligated to take care of our roads and maintain them and plow them and do all the other things. Or these are all all these all private roads built to, um, you know, somebody's standards at the back in the 1970s. So we, good question. Yeah, we we own the roads. <laughs> they're, they're, they're our they're our roads. They're not county roads. Um, pardon? The county contributed. Uh, no, not to any any uh, replacement, any repair, uh, any reserves, so on and so forth. And you know, the only money uh, actually, Joe, I think what was it? The state used to give us about five hundred thousand dollars, and that stopped when about four years ago, five years ago. Four hundred fifty thousand dollars a year we received in state road funds through the county that our late governor, not late, but former governor, Tom <laughs> Alley, took away. Gotcha. Okay. So, I, I, I mean, I know in, in a lot of you know nonprofit organizations, there's people on the staff who write um, requests for proposals to get charitable donations given to them by for grants. Excuse me, by grants. And it would seem to me that 
we should have somebody looking at what kind of benefits that we can get from the county for our taxes and what we can, you know, because I think we pay a lot of taxes for not a lot of benefits. And it would seem to me that, you know, here's a case where O'Malley took some of our benefits away, and <coughs> I'd like to see somebody on the staff look at what benefits that we can get for our you know, <coughs> annual tax dollars. Percent of the retired people that's well within this community already. I think we need to put our minds yeah. together yeah. Yeah. and on that. So that's just one thing. And then I'll, I'll, I'll just stop right there. But I, I do want to say, though, uh, Chip Partino wrote an interesting article about the Kerwin Commission and how our <coughs> county, our Ocean Pines citizens, pay an unfair share of the school expenses. And I would like to see. I mean, I'm only one person, and I could write a letter to somebody, but it'd be nice to have the Ocean Pines community stand up and en masse and write to the Kerwin Commission about the unfair uh, burden that the Ocean Pines residents are being uh, placed upon to support our school system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it's over discussion. <laughs> yeah. All right, so to sum up, the instruction of the general manager currently is to go back and make this payroll adjustment we talked about, to go to four years on the deficit reduction, leave the bulkhead, go ahead. The complete 128. The complete 128 comes out completely out of it. Okay. Um, leave the bulkheads in as is, the 19 and the 465, and pull the roads out 100%. So that's intermediate guidance for you right now. Um, there's two other things I wanted to say real quick because I think um, sometimes some of the board members get a bad rap because they run on the idea that hey I'm going to hold assessments down and I'm going to do this. Every single person that walks into here gets their eyes opened up when they actually walk in the room and they start to look at what it costs to operate and where the money goes. Um, and I was fortunate as one of the ones elected last year, I was the only one that was an incumbent, so I didn't make any of those promises, but it's only because I had some advanced knowledge. So we all try to hold them down. I don't want to pay anymore. Um, but also, you get your eyes open to a lot of stuff that you didn't know when you walk in and you start to see what things cost and what's happened and what's happened in the past to set it. And I don't think there's a person sitting at this table that doesn't want to not pay more than, than we need to, believe me. There's, if you watch what's happening with reserves over the next couple of years, John has talked about it, Gene has talked about it, they're beginning to, to creep downward. And so we're just trying to maintain reasonable numbers as we go forward. The other thing is, I just wanted to give everybody this because we always talk about our assessments and, and we're a different thing. We've got to deal with our thing. But just this just comes from a local realtor who I asked recently to talk to check out some of the assessments locally sea colony and not the stuff that's right on the water all those townhouses back there 2,424 Bayside 3,044 Millville by the sea 2448 and from a couple of years ago 117 Glen Riddle single-family houses $3,108 um, River Run right down the street, 2,184. So it's a, it's a different situation, but I want to tell you that we're doing the very best we can to keep it down and still maintain the property values here. So that, I just want to give you some perspective. It may be different people and stuff, but that's where we're at. Ted, can I add you? That benchmarking is excellent. I also want to point out they don't even have half the amenities and services that Ocean Pines that we have. <laughs> So you can't use that to rationalize numbers, though. I mean, if people are local coming from New York, they will be pay that kind of number. I, I don't know. I don't know. We're not, I'm not saying that that's what we need. The tags are still on all the other stuff. So, so do they. But I'm just saying that we've done a pretty good job as an association keeping the numbers reasonable, <laughs> given what we have. He's dealt with it, and I mean, I know that the inflationary has gone that way from 2001 to today, being 100%. And I'm just stunned hard. You know. um, my name is Jay Persky, uh, 1461 Ocean Parkway. 
Uh, we're new here. We moved here in May. We're really happy to like the community. This is, as you said, an eye-opening process. I'm glad I've been sitting there for the last several hours and really understanding this. I, I didn't have a problem with paying extra, but I, I also didn't know anything about the process. I didn't know anything about the details that we're going into. I see people who I believe in my heart seem to care and are trying to work together with many different personalities to do what's right, and that is encouraging to me as a homeowner. So thank you for that. Um, when I read the newspaper article, one thing did jump out to me about the $500,000 for the states of the building, which this gentleman said about petitioning the government, uh, could, or I don't know what's involved in getting our community mobilizing if you have 8,000 homeowners. That's a lot of people, that's a lot of voters. To really try and make a push to get some, not all that money back, one way, shape, or form from the state government, and you can get 20% of the people to make phone calls, write letters, or whatever to Annapolis. We might get in here or two, and uh, so, but thank you. Thank you, Williams, 78 Teal, sir. Um, it's obvious we're going to have to have an increase. And I've been, I've been here since... 2002, I've actually been coming over since 1979. <coughs> in the fall, look from Lookout Point all the way up Ocean Park. So I've been um, understood the premises on which Ocean Pines was going to be built on. Now here, some of us say, you know, our homeowner association is not bad. We get a lot. I don't know what a lot is because compared to what I know, we don't get a lot. It's not like Florida, where you pay a large assessment and you do get quite a bit. Um, I just think that if we're going to increase assessments, you know, a selling point making people feel good, make them think they're getting something for their money. Two passes a year for golf, two passes a year for swimming, two passes a year for tennis. It's not costing us anything. You know, and, and then some of us can kind of, you know, cushion that. But when you're talking about uh, increased assessment, I pay for my own trash removal. Uh, the county comes by, I guess, whenever they want to and cuts the grass. I still have exposed wires on my property that I called about for media com or whoever. You know, those things are taken into consideration. What am I getting? You know, uh, I'm, I'm glad that the north side pays into the bulk care fee because I, I was on the south side of where in, in both ways and I had to pay my own, so I'm kind of fortunate about that. But this one, six and and one and a half dozen another, if nothing goes wrong with my bouquet, then I save the money, but I'm paying into a fee or a fund, which I don't mind in case if something does happen, it's taken care of. But outside of that, what am I getting? Like Joe just said, my taxes went up. I'm okay right now with it, but it's not about me. It's some people who are a little bit older than I am, even though I'm retired, and their income might be a little lower than mine. You know, um, what, what are we giving? Are we get, they're getting forced out, they can't pay anymore. You know, we have to look at those things that we can control. And what can we do to our residents to make them think that, hey, look, you know, we are getting something for the, the money that we're not paying. Thank you very much. I think that's a really good idea about the perks. I want to tell you that. I think it's a really good idea. It doesn't really hurt us to give something extra to the homeowners. Um, but I know I'd like to talk to the other directors about this. I think it's a really good idea. And thank you for bringing it yeah, to us. Yeah, because, I mean, for example, when you're in Florida and you pay those high home association fees, if you're not a golfer, you're paying for somebody else, that's fine, good humanitarian, but it costs you more money if you're not a swimmer. You know, the one thing we have here is our cart. But I think if we, you know, it's best to have and not to need and need not to have. So if my grandchildren come and I can give them, you know, I have a T-O-D, I have a golfer, I can give her, you know, two passes to go. Now I don't mind paying what we pay, but I'm just saying that we can give our residents something to let them understand. An extra incentive, so to speak. Yes. You know, thank yes. you for being a homeowner here. You got kids that come in, here's a couple free pool passes right. because maybe you don't partake in golf. Right. Or something. I much. completely get what you're saying. I think it's a really, really good idea. I would support that. <laughs> I think 
one of the problems that I have as an association member is that we, we hear these big picture discussions. But in the past, we had line by line discussions of the board, of the budget by the Budget Finance Committee and the Board of Directors. I haven't really seen that in the last year or two. Uh, for example, Capitol Road. I never heard anybody mention during the budget discussions. Maybe they did, maybe I missed it. We're going to spend. How much money are we spending on uh, Capitol Road for landscaping? From the replacement Capitol Road? Yeah, 28000 $28, I believe it is. $28,000. That's more than some people collect for Social Security a year. And we're going to spend that money on landscaping on Capitol Road. What in the devil are we going to do on Capitol Road? It's already lined with trees all over there. <laughs> are we going to spend $28,000 on mulch? I mean, somebody needs to question these expenses. And if it's not done at the board level and the budget finance level, it'll never be done. Because as closely as I follow this stuff, I'm not aware of everything that's in that budget. But somebody needs to be. And somebody needs to question every single item line by line. Why is this? Why is this going up? Why is it going down? Why are we spending this? I haven't seen that this year. I, I didn't see it last year either. I'm still Gene Ringstorf, and I still live at five minutes of feet forward. Um, I'm here representing myself, not as your assistant treasurer. Uh, I moved here in 2002, and since 2003, every fiscal year I've made this proposal, I've made it, and I'm going to make it again. I, I didn't do it one year because Tom Terry said, do me a favor, don't bring it up. <laughs> but I am, I am suggesting there is a potential revenue stream that we're missing and that is charging a fee for usage of the parking at the boat ramp at Whitehorse Park. Uh, that's the only single use, adult uh, use amenity that we don't charge the users a fee for. The golfers got to pay for golf, swimmers have to pay for pool. You name it, tenants, even a walk your dog to take a pool, you got to pay a fee. But you don't have to pay a fee for using that boat ramp. And I think it would generate some revenue. And I know this board has already passed that, but uh, we can't keep passing by revenue generating ideas. Thank you. So, 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 yeah, just, uh, just wanted to respond to uh, Gene as a homeowner. <laughs> you know, you make a very good point, but it's not just really a point, it's actually something that's been overlooked in the past. If you look at our resolution, boat ramp is listed as a fee-based amenity. So we're actually supposed to be setting a fee for its usage. Now why we haven't done this in the past, I really don't know. I think uh, that's the question for the staff, the department that's in charge. It's a question for the GM. Uh, it's a question for the board. I so, to tell you why it goes before the Marine Advisory Committee who all own boats and they don't want it. Well, you know, it's not about whether they, what they want or not. It's about complying with our resolution. You know? Yeah. That's the bottom line, and we just have to enforce it. Once and, I go into the system, no. I'll stop. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, thanks for, thanks for bring, bringing that up. I also want to, on behalf of my colleagues here, I want to welcome new members to the association that have made comments. They're not here, but, uh, you know, welcome to our community. Um, it's, um, it's great to, to see some positive feedbacks from the newcomers. Um, if I got Ted's um, earlier comment correctly, are you suggesting we kind of st start getting into the wrap-up mode um, and summarize what we want to have the GM walk away with? So next um, Saturday we have almost ready to vote on budget version. Is that what we're doing? Okay. So yeah. So let me just make a couple of a uh, couple of comments on that because uh, I, I didn't hear you. Um, bring up um, a couple of things that we spent a lot of time on. One is um, uh, the 2.5% uh, cut. I would like to, for this board, to convey to the manager if that's what we want to see next Saturday. Uh, $311,000 
cut across built into that new version of the budget that we're going to vote on. I want to see that not because it's, it sounds good, it's a good number, it's basically what the board asked the GM to do, the uh, directive. Um, and if there are any other savings that can be accomplished, uh, you know, I challenge you to, to be creative. Uh, like I said, you know, uh, look, at, look at other areas, uh, marketing, uh, anything where we can trim things to improve our, um, our budget and bottom line for this year. Uh, you know, if we don't put ads in the TV, on the TV uh, and other things, you know, these are the things that can be dealt with. Um, other things cannot and should not, uh, but these are the things that, that can be delayed. The other thing that wasn't brought up, it's, it's a small dollar amount, but every little bit adds up, and it becomes, you know, a, an amount that you don't want to ignore. We have budgeted, uh, the GM suggested increasing legal fees by $50,000. Now, we have spent probably over $40,000 this year uh, on legal fees, fees related to the media com uh, contract uh, uh, agreement restructuring. That's not a recurring expense. So um, I would like to see really a more control over our legal fees going forward uh, and because they have gone up for various reasons. But um, is it really necessary to you know, allocate $50,000 on, on for next year on based on current legal fees expenditures when we know $40,000 plus of that was a one-time occurrence. So again, small amount, but every little bit adds up. And you know, you may end up with uh, 10, 15, 13 dollars per homeowner. That's going to help the bottom line. Yeah, on, on that very note, I had in my notes that uh, uh, we should be knocking down if we knock it down another 25k, that's about three dollars. We go 50, it's about six dollars. But uh, I'm with you. It's 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 the same. I use the same logic. We have a one-time occurrence of a you know a legal fee that uh, you know we won't have again next year. So Ted gave a kind of somewhat subtle approach to summarizing the meeting. I'm going to be giving you a more blunt and forward approach. Let's try to wrap it up. Uh, not only have we been sitting up here, but our colleagues out here have been sitting in the audience now what three hours and 20 minutes. So. Um, you know, I don't think that there's anything that uh, we probably overlooked or couldn't at least continue discussion over email or phone calls or however. So, um, Ted, it was a great summary. Uh, I know you want to say something, but, uh, you know, let's make sure, let's go around the table one time, make sure we're sort of any, any final comments. And then, Ted, I'll let you to, again, summarize so we can walk away from that. So, before, before you do that, Collette, anything? Excuse me. Yeah. You want to say something oh. you summarize? Oh, Tom, by all means, yeah. please. Um, Tom Byerly, uh, Six Oceans End. A um, couple things, just statement, and then I have some questions. Uh, moved here in summer of uh, 15, um, and just after the yacht club was completed, and um, had an election for a new board, and basically uh, <laughs> that, that election went to get rid of Bob Thompson. That was the agenda for the election, and people went on the board, and they got rid of him. I don't know anything about Bob Thompson except for the fact that he was involved in the yacht club build, and for some reason, at the end of the time when y'all got rid of him, he was operating in the black or red or whatever color you decided you want to use, um, which was pretty interesting. Um, and at that point, the sort of the hen house was open, and y'all got Fred Hill to come in. <coughs> Excuse me and take care of everything. And from that point on, that's where a deficit came from, I believe. I'm not sure, but all of a sudden we started losing money. He took and changed his whole place around. <coughs> security and people were standing right and left there. Put security gates in, cameras, all kinds of crazy stuff. Apparently it was a shit, I think. Excuse my French, but whatever it was, that's where a deficit came from. The board, let him have it. They were the ones put him in place and said, you run the thing until we can find a new GM. Um, which we did. Ended up getting someone. And, and my thing is, I know a deficit you have to make up for. But the deficit wasn't created by the people. The deficit was created by what you all did. By taking and changing the whole scenario of this place. 
we got a new GM, and basically his job is to take what information, what you guys want to do, I think, and research it, come up with the best way to do it, come up with the prices and all that kind of stuff. Now whether he's doing that or whether he isn't, I don't know. You all would know that better than I do. But anyway, that's the scenario. I mean, we're, our deficit was created by the poor network team. You want us to make up the deficit. You want us to keep sending money out and everything else to make up for your all screw. That's getting old. A lot of people are getting tired. I know it's not a debt. I know it's a deficit. I know you have to have the deficit to move forward and make up the difference. But that's just my feelings on that. I think we need to figure out some way that just doesn't happen again, that we don't get all our politics involved in kicking the old yacht club to death and build a new building we didn't need that big. The whole scenario, the way it went down, who built it, who built it. We had a roof that leaked with the mold. I mean, it was just a bad scenario. But we paid for it. You raised our assessment 50 bucks to pay for the yacht club for five years, to pay $5 million. We paid for it. And we go here to the golf course. We spent $500,000 in the golf course. I don't know where they spent $500,000. I mean, I work part-time in the summer. I don't know where it went, or how much it went, or where they did with it, or whatever. But my question is, and, and I don't understand the whole workings of this, but everybody has a budget they start the year with. If Public Works has one, golf has one, swim has one. Everybody's got a budget. They try to stay within their budget. <clears throat> I got a problem at the yacht club, let's say. Then call Public Works. Public Works comes out and looks at it and goes, yeah, it's a good luck. It sucks. It's not working. They charge you to go look at it. Then they charge you to go fix it. I mean, Public Works, we're paying ourselves. It's going from one budget to another budget. We spend, if we spend $500,000 at the golf course, we paid three hundred fifty thousand of the public works because they're the ones that did the job. They're the ones that are coming in there now and going, "We can't live with this. This place is a wreck. We got to tear it down." They put. I mean, public works did the job, and it all the budget on sure paid public works. It's like a Ferris wheel. Take money out of car sixteen, put it in car eight. Take out of car eight, put it in car twelve. I mean, we're paying ourselves, just like we want to borrow money from ourselves. We're not in debt. We have reserves, and I know you're supposed to have. But is it true that one entity is paying the other entity? I mean, that's not a loss. When the over budget at the golf course, because public works came in, and cut all the fire equipment out, and we got to pay 12, 12 hours a day fire watch, I mean, we're paying them to do that. They're costing how much money is it costing them? We did it. We did it ourselves. The people, I think, are getting tired of paying. So all I can say is, <clears throat> hopefully we can learn something from this and try to figure out some better way to do it. If it's one group paying another group, let's get it right. Let's realize we're a community, public works, those things at the pool, and things at our club and do things here. It's all one big happy family. Mr. Bailey said something in a paper a while back. <coughs> we were talking about the fire rings and the fire pits. And he came out and said, use your head. Be neighbors. <coughs> the people next to you have a big party. Don't burn some, some stuff here. Think of your neighbors, think of the other people in the community, and use your own common sense. I think that's what we got to need to do. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, all right, Gene, out of what's a takeaway, what's a takeaway that the uh, sports board building is now? Yes. 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 All right. Around the table, Celeste. Yeah, I want to thank everybody for coming today and giving their input. We um, started off on kind of an acrimonious note in the beginning of the meeting, and I appreciate that that settled down and we really concluded this meeting with civility and respect. Um, I'm grateful for the appreciation that has been um, shown to the board for the difficult challenge that we have and the work that we do. 
um, and I appreciate the fact that the membership recognizes that we're doing the best we can with a tough situation and that we are hearing and responding to the concerns that you bring to us. Um, I agree with um, the items that we've gotten to in terms of the takeaways. There's one item that, I, that was on my list that we didn't really talk about. This um, is a recommendation that came from our GM that at some point we need to talk about funding a capital reserve um, budget. New capital. New capital. Uh, for new capital projects, and I don't want us to lose sight of that. I think that may, that's not a takeaway for this year's budget, but it's a takeaway that we need to not let get lost over the course of the next year. And then the other item that we didn't really talk about is funding the um, police station. Are we going to borrow, borrow from ourselves? Are we going to borrow from somebody else? How are we going to set that interest rate if we borrow from ourselves? I don't want to get that lost in the shuffle either, because I think that's an important issue. But otherwise, I want to thank my board colleagues for the respect and civility they've shown to each other today, and pass it on to the next person for comment. Thank you, Claire. John. Okay, so, okay, so, Claire just mentioned a lot of things I just wrote down, but for, when I see a turnout, I like that. I like when I see everybody here, or, or as much as possible from the association. A lot of passion, people want to understand what's going on, and they give their comments, which everybody I do with at this table, I certainly listen to, or I read, whether it's the forum, Ace Like Gazette, the progress. So I like that. Hopefully we answered a lot of the questions, or we're moving in the right direction. As far as the board, I've been asked, by many uh, outside of this room, maybe somebody in here, uh, are they doing their due diligence? Are they, are they working on this budget? Are they looking at it? I can assure you that this board, more than ever, is doing their due diligence, looking into all the information, um, trying to right size or whatever it is that they come up with. And you saw it today. Uh, I do believe they're working together, um, and I compliment them on that. Well, first, thanks for your interest. Uh, and second, it uh, looks like uh, today's activities we've kind of agreed to I don't know, $50 or so, 47 up for roads, whatever, to reduce the budget. But look, a couple things. Number one, we owe it to you to keep this budget as low as possible, consistent with maintaining the asset base of the association. And we're going to do that. Second thing that we owe you, things that we defer, Okay, they're going to come down the road. We also need to let you know at the end of this budgeting process so that as much as possible, you're not surprised the next year. So when we talk about taking $47 off the roads, the roads aren't going to heal themselves over the next 365 days. It's something that we've made a conscious decision to keep things low and affordable for the demographics, understanding that we're going to have to face that. We should outline that to you so you completely understand it. But, you know, we're homeowners too, we pay the assessments, we try to keep it as low as possible, consistent with maintaining things in the best possible working order. And thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Frank. Yes. First, I want to thank everyone for their public comments. A um, couple things. Um, I've been contacted by a lot of people on fixed income, and I just want that to be known. We do hear you. We understand it. Um, it's not just fixed income. We also have people who've got young families here who also can't afford these type of increases. So we do hear you. Again, I think it was a great idea with the perks. It's something I definitely, I know the other directors are interested in looking into. Really a great idea. Um, we are working really hard to try to fix this. Some of this we inherited. It's unfortunate, but we did. It's neither here nor there, but we are trying to work. I can tell you this board does work very well together. I feel we are very cohesive. Um, and we do appreciate the community being involved with this. Thanks, Ted. Ted, I'm going to skip you because I want you to do this on the summary. Yeah. <laughs> you signed up for it. Yeah. <laughs> Steve. Okay, I, I too just uh, echo the colleague's support. Uh, thanks for you all being here. Um, the only question I had on my list of things that I had sent out earlier was related to something Colette said was. Uh, whether we borrow money from ourselves or from a bank, I don't see any point in borrowing it at six if we can borrow from ourselves if the cash would allow it. 
Thanks, Steve. So long. Thanks, Doug. Um, well, I'll echo what everybody else said in terms of thanking, uh, thanking the homeowners that are here and those that are paying attention to uh, what the board is doing, what the association management is doing. A um, few points I'd like to make, uh, just kind of to wrap it up from my perspective, aside from what we already spoke about during the past three and a half hours. Um, I'd like to ask the GM to have the new draft ready to us by midweek uh, so that we have time to digest it and if we have any issues we want to shoot it back to the him, to him and to form a feedback so that uh, he's ready by Saturday morning so we have hopefully an outcome as opposed to uh, what happened in Washington, yeah. <laughs> closing the shop. We obviously don't want to do that. Um, so that's one thing. If you can provide us with a new draft midweek, that would be very helpful for everybody. Number two, um, I think a lot of the things that, that, that I feel we've been challenged by is, um, is related to uh, a need to have a multi-year budget plan. And I think if we have something like that, a lot of these things are, I believe would be more clear to the membership, more clear to the management and to the board. So I would, uh, you know, and I think uh, we have a great treasurer, great assistant treasurer, a lot of experience at the budget and finance committee level. So to have a multi-year budget plan, I think would be very helpful for a number of different reasons, uh, which leads me into um, talking about new capital projects. If you have a strategic plan, that strategic plan becomes a roadmap and what the community wants in terms of investments in a new capital. You know, ideas don't get born, they, they get born overnight, but to implement them, to fund them, to execute them takes years of, of planning and years of, uh, of work. So I would encourage, and I, I know we have asked the GM in the past to have this done, but I, and I do believe that is still something that's very important. It's a roadmap that's gonna guide us uh, how we're going to plan to improve and enhance this community and how we're going to fund it. Where is that roadmap? <laughs> Sorry? Where is that roadmap for new capital? I'm talking about a strategic plan. Where is it? I'm asking for one. We've been asking for one. Okay. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm asking. You're acknowledging we don't have Yes, yeah, I'm acknowledging the need to have one. Yeah, yeah. So I'm acknowledging, because that's really what's going to drive our new capital projects and how we're going to fund it. So yeah, I'm sorry, Joe, if I wasn't clear enough. <laughs> so, and, and the second part of that, uh, my final point, is really a capital improvement plan, which deals with, uh, you know, what's going to be funded out of, our, out of our reserves. We need to complete that. You know, so that's going to help us plan properly our future budgets, not just on a year-to-year -year basis, but multi-year basis. Things like this should not come up as a, as a surprise. So let's get the CIP done, let's get a strategic plan developed and in place, run it by the community, we have town hall meetings, we can have hearings, we can do surveys, we can listen to what the homeowners want. So then when we come up with the idea of how much money to collect to finance our new projects, new capital projects, nobody is going to really be surprised because they'll know what they're paying for and what they're going to get in return. So I'll, I'll just wrap it up with, with those few comments from my from my perspective. I want to thank everybody for their time. Thanks, Luda. Ted, you're next to list. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to rehash everything, JB. I think you've got a pretty clear indication of what we need. Is that correct? And ask the board. Put something together. Exactly. So something else. Right, okay. and, and I just want to say for everybody that's kind of seeing this for the first time, please go on our website under for, under administration forms and documents. The budget is up on there, and it is broken down into multiple areas. You can look at every function in Ocean Pines and go back and look three or four years as to performance. So if you really want to learn what's going on, because the, the biggest thing here is, is to be interested in what's happening to your money, whether the assessment's going up or not. And that's, you know, who guards the guardians. And, and I just think that if you go and you look and you see where it is, then you're in a much better position to give input. And the other thing I would commend is anybody who's really interested in the finances, I can tell you that BNF 
will sit with you and walk through any area you want to walk through in Ocean Pines at any of their committee meetings or after that or at a, another time. And they've done a great job of doing that and, and taking input. So that's it for me. So the BNF is, is generally, right, but it is listed on the website. It usually is the third. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know how long I can get it to you, but it's usually the third, but it depends on when we receive the financials. Uh, that I don't think the way you can reach me or whatever. I'm glad to help you if you don't want so, But I would like to see you there. I would like the opportunity, yes. And I'll answer all your questions. So in, in, in closing, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't echo the sentiments of uh, my colleagues here, thanking everybody for their participation and their uh, input with regard to the budget. I know it's a, it's a very important issue to, it is to not only uh, us as a board, but us as association members as well. Um, the, uh, you know, we have some marching orders, at least uh, some summary of what we want to attack, uh, areas we want to reconsider. And uh, certainly, I firmly believe that that uh, will reduce the budget by uh, you know, a, a significant amount. I'm sorry, the, the assessment increase by a significant amount. Um, I do want to touch on the, uh, the strategic plan. I, that, that's something that I've also been asking for over the past couple of years. We, if we floated the concept. Uh, one thing I am very strongly about, and for those of you who go back and look at the video from last year, one of the things I mentioned uh, to this concept of a uh, you know, new capital reserve fund uh, you know, is is good in concept, uh, except I think there's a, a a real tendency that it could turn into a slush fund. Because again, it goes back to that same concept that I've talked about as boards change over and over. You know, that same message may not get transmitted from the board who originated it to the second board who sustained it to the third board who's now going to manage it. And I think the concept is sound. I wish I had an answer on how we can absolutely make certain that once those funds were established. Uh, that they were earmarked, you know, and for a specific capital purchase and couldn't be changed by another board. That's a real, that's a real challenge. Uh, so it's something that uh, you know I certainly want to float by other folks because I think it's it's certainly conceptually sound, but whether the practicality of it is whether we can manage it or not. But again, that's too many semantics. So again, just echoing the sentiments, we do work together. We certainly have various opinions, approaches, and so on and so forth. I think the blending of all of that really allows us to come up with a lot of different perspectives and sets us in the right direction, including the input from the association. At the end of the day, we report to the association. Uh, I mean, the, some, some people, I hope, I hope, it, sometimes it needs to be said. I mean, certainly it's, it's hard to infer, so I'd rather just say it out front. We work for you, okay? So the input, uh, as, what, as you always hear me say, send a message, send an email to directors at, at, um, uh, at oceanpines.org. Uh, our phone numbers are published, so if you have a, an, an opportunity to call, please do so. Uh, so we've, more, we've got more work to do. We'll, uh, there's another budget meeting on uh, uh, on Saturday. I'm sorry, a board meeting on Saturday with we'll, we'll, we'll the budget. One last announcement. Uh, I believe we have uh, selected a date for the next town hall meeting. That will be the 30th uh, of this month. I believe it's going to be at I'm sorry, March 30th. March 30th. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And it's a Saturday. And, uh, uh, and more to come on that particular agenda. So we, because again, that is correct. That's the intention. That that that. Uh, hopefully, everyone heard what Joe just said. We will be voting on the budget at the board meeting next Saturday. Okay. No, no, it's an open meeting. No, Maryland law. Okay. No, Maryland law, eleven B one twelve dot two. We have to. We, we have to hold it, hold it in an open meeting. Okay, I know that uh, I was supposed to close the meeting, but I would be remiss if I ignored someone. Please go ahead. I have one question. Uh, we know that you're working on a budget. We saw the proposed budget on that packet we picked up if we came last week, and I'm hoping that we want to go listen to this, what's reading online. What I would like to have is something simplified instead of going through on um, team pages online looking for what I need. Is there some way you could say like B6 was cut, A7 was cut, D9 was cut, like if you're taking out the 200,000, say that's been cut. If you're taking out the screenings for the tennis court, say that's been cut. If you're taking out this, you know, we need to know that the frivolous things that are in there are gone, that they're not hidden under something else. I appreciate it. I'm sure a lot of the residents would appreciate it too. So think okay. about that. Okay. Give us, give us something we come in and say, this is what we cut the next time. 
David, is there, is there a way we could summarize that information? I know you're going to do a, a follow-up, but I, I mean, especially, and this is preliminary information, but there was a lot of things right here where right, the, the, big pieces, the big pieces that go, hey, you know, yeah. this is where, rather, I, so maybe a um, sort of compromise would be rather than line by line, if we could list the initiative, Right, and so, say so this, this is what it cost. Cut, would that, yeah. would that, okay, because I, you know, I think cut, it might be dog park was cut, or just strange things, yeah, you know. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise, we don't know. So, you say, oh, we cut one hundred fifty thousand dollars out. Well, wonderful. Where did you cut from? We don't know. Yeah, we so need to know where you're cutting things. So. So for the May I time I'm trying to close the meeting, but John, I'm sorry. please go right ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. No, it, it, it's, what the ladies bring it up, it, it should be part of the process. There should always be a reconciliation. Everything I ever did for 40 years, it, it would help. It, it's not something that's hard to do. We actually, with Ted gave the numbers to um, JV, that should be part of it. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. And it's not hard to do. Thank you. Actually, John, you got, you've got got what page is that on the base? I said the top of that thing right there. So, is that something that so, we're going to do? So, we so, um, what Doug's pointing to is on page 13 of the Bay Site Gazette. There is something like that, a reconciliation. When Doug came to my house on January 27th or whatever, I did a reconciliation from real quick off the top of my head on what we can do. This is something that has to be done with any type of financials. And, and it's easy to do. Thank you. Okay. All right, once more for the good of the order. Seeing none. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>